You ready for me to gavel in? The answer was no. Dean, we cannot hear you. Ralph started. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's New York City uh, hearing. Uh, at this time, we ask that everyone to silence all electronic devices. We need everyone to turn their cameras at the beginning of the hearing uh, on for proper identification. Please mute your microphones on Zoom. Microphones will be unmuted for you when it's your turn to speak. Silence all electronic devices so as to eliminate any disturbances during your testimony. Any members of the public wishing to testify can email their statements to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, you can email your testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Uh, we are ready to begin today's hearing. Welcome to today's hearing held by Committee on Housing and Buildings, chaired by myself, and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing, chaired by Council Member Andrew Cohen. We're also joined today by Speaker Corby Johnson, who would like to share some opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Chairs Cornegy and Cohen, for holding this hearing today. Nice to see everyone. I hope everyone is safe and healthy. And I want to just remember all of the uh, heroes out there, our healthcare workers, and all of the city workers that we have lost, so many of them uh, during this hard time. This crisis has us fighting on two fronts, against the virus and against an unprecedented economic crisis. We can't forget that the suffering and, and anxiety in New York City right now isn't just about health. It's also about people's economic circumstances. When you're being hounded by creditors because you're behind on bills or your landlord may be harassing you for your rent, or you're worried about whether you can afford to feed your family, that fear can become overwhelming. New York City was in a housing emergency even before this epidemic. Almost a third of New Yorkers were late on their rent. 20% had the utility shut off and 19% were doubled up in apartments. 15% were facing eviction. Almost half of New Yorkers are at or near the poverty line. And now, over half a million workers are probably out of a job. The ripple effects here are devastating. Unemployment benefits will help, but it's not that simple. Not everyone is eligible and payments have been very slow to arrive. If you were struggling before and had to pay your bills with credit cards or borrow money, back payments aren't going to make you whole. That means that many tenants won't be able to pay rent, but keeping renters in their homes has to be our number one priority not just during this crisis, but after the emergency orders are lifted. We have to give New Yorkers impacted by this crisis a fighting chance to get back on their feet. So today we're hearing two bills that will help give New Yorkers some peace of mind to let them know that the city council is going to do everything we can to make sure New Yorkers aren't, uh, aren't going to suffer harms that we can't fix later. We can't compound the tragedies we're already seeing by letting New Yorkers become homeless or have creditors go after them because of no fault of their own. Introduction 1936, which I'm co-sponsoring with Councilmember Torres, would protect tenants impacted by COVID-19 from landlords who may retaliate against them. And intro 1912, which I'm co-sponsoring, which I've sponsored, would protect the hundreds of thousands of vulnerable New Yorkers and struggling business owners. While many mortgage holders have been offered more concrete relief, renters and business owners are left to worry about what will happen when temporary eviction moratoriums are lifted. And those with debts like medical bills or credit cards are left to hope that their lenders will do the right thing. We're gonna need rent cancellation and reductions. 
But while we work to make that happen, we need to put a backstop in place. Not, introduction 1912 will prevent marshals and city sheriffs from taking property or executing money judgments. This means that evictions and debt collection would be paused. It also means tenants would have time to repay their rent. This would apply to actions against all New Yorkers through September or longer if the state of emergency continues into the fall. If you were impacted by COVID-19, marshals and sheriffs would be banned from collecting debts and performing evictions until April of 2021. We have a lot more work here, but I believe these bills will put us on the right track. I wanna thank all the advocates, the stakeholders, and the members of the administration who are here today. I look forward to hearing from you all, and I now turn it back over to Chair Carnegie. Chair Carnegie? Did we lose uh, the chair? I'll turn it over to Chair Cohen. All right. Um, are we still looking for Rob? What's, uh... I don't see him on here, so I would, uh, you may want to go, Andy. All right. Uh, oops. Uh, now I'm gone. No, you're here. Oh, okay. Nice, nice. Oy. <laughs> I don't know why my screen is going. You're on. I appreciate that, except that my screen, unfortunately, for some reason, has gone black, and it's going to be hard to read my opening. Okay. It happens. I don't know what's going on. Take your time. Thank you to everyone for your patience. So, you know, doing this remotely uh, isn't easy, so I appreciate everyone bearing with us. If uh, the sergeants or Carl, if you're there, if you could reach out to uh, Chair Carnegie. The process of doing that now. Thank you. Uh, I am happy to give my opening. So okay, go ahead. Um, I don't want to freelance, but I'm going to start by wishing my speaker a happy birthday today. Thank you. And then I'm going to uh, say good afternoon to everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Cohen and I'm the chair of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing. Uh, I wanna thank everyone who has managed to join us for this remote hearing. Uh, I wanna thank council member Carnegie, even if you can't hear me right this second, uh, because for the driving force behind this hearing. Um, as it will be mentioned at today's hearing, uh, we're seeking feedback on two pieces of legislation. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from a broad spectrum of stakeholders, including tenants, property owners, the marshals, sheriffs, the advocates, uh, and the public, uh, so that the council can get a better perspective on both sides of the issue. Uh, with these bills, the council hopes to mitigate tenant harassment during the COVID-19 crisis and help keep as many folks as possible in their homes and business properties. Uh, in addition, the council recognizes many landlords are facing financial pressures and need to weigh in on, the, on these issues during these challenging times. Uh, intro 1912, which has been introduced by the speaker, would limit the actions of city sheriffs and marshals, could would limit the action city marshals and sheriffs could take uh, during both the pandemic and post-crisis recovery. The COVID emergency is disrupt disrupting people's lives in the most horrific of ways. So the last thing that they should have to worry about is having uh, their money or property seized. Uh, I am very supportive of the various eviction moratoria by both uh, the state and federal governments. And, and as the chair of Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing Committee, uh, I am very happy to see that we are trying to do what we can on the local level. Uh, I commend the speaker on his leadership on this issue. I look forward to gathering feedback from our witnesses today so that we can ensure that this legislation successfully achieves its aims. Uh, before we begin the testimony, I would like to thank uh, the, the central staff uh, for the hours and hours and hours of work it took um, to get the, me prepared uh, uh, and to get this hearing up and running. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge uh, the committee members uh, who have joined us uh, I think we have council members Chin, Kozlowitz, uh, Lander, Brennan, 
Ku and Jaeger. Uh, and with that, I don't know if Rob is back, but I will back. turn it back over to Rob. Thank you, Rob. Yep. Uh, sorry about that. I don't know. We lost my lost my feet a little bit, but thank you for jumping right in, Chair Cohen, as you always do, and saving the day. Um, I want to thank Speaker Johnson and also wish him a, a very happy birthday. Unfortunately, you have to celebrate it with us in this way, uh, but you're always willing to stand up and, and, and be there for us. So I appreciate you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, as we all know, the impacts of the novel coronavirus have been devastating and vast. At this hearing, the committees hope to gain a better understanding of the economic Im implications of the virus. With special attention paid to the struggles of tenants as residents citywide face unprecedented financial strain. To that end, We'll also be hearing two pieces of legislation aimed at protecting tenants as the city works to recover from this crisis. In an effort to curtail the spread of the virus, the state has been on pause since March, which has been a critical tool to facilitate social distancing and save lives. An unfortunate but necessary component of this pause is the closure of non-essential businesses effectively stalling much of the city's economy. The result has been a loss of employment for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers, and the numbers continue to grow. Now in a city where a disproportionate share of the population was rent burdened even prior to the pandemic, more and more residents are not sure how they will make rent. In an effort to mitigate some of the renters' concerns, the state and federal government have each enacted measures to halt evictions for a period of time. While this allows tenants to remain in their apartments for now, it does not guarantee that tenants unable to pay rent will be able to stay in their apartment once eviction actions resume, or that tenants will be safe from the landlord harassment on the basis of having impacted, have been, having been impacted by the virus. Today we'll, hear, we'll be hearing two bills that seek to provide additional long-term protections to tenants affected by the crisis. The first is intro 1912, which is sponsored by the speaker. This bill would prohibit the city sheriff and marshals from taking certain actions related to eviction and debt collection until the end of the first month after the state of emergency of September 30th, 2020, whichever is latter. For New Yorkers impacted by COVID-19, the effects of the bill would be to extend until the end of the seventh month after the state of emergency or April 1st, 2021, which is latter, whichever is latter. Second is intro 1936 which is sponsored by council member Richie Torres and the speaker. This bill would make it illegal for a landlord to harass a tenant based on their status as a person impacted by COVID-19, including whether they're an essential worker or because they were laid off or because they received a rental concession or forbearance where the eviction moratoria were in effect. We look forward to hearing from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, the Department of Finance and the Commission on Human Rights, as well as from interested members of the public about these bills. We will now hear an opening statement from Chair Cohen. Well, actually, you already hold that statement from Chair Cohen. Thank you so much. Um, I do want to add, uh, before we go into testimony, uh, that we've also been joined by Justin Brennan, Richie Torres, and Farrah Lewis. At this point, I'll hand it over to, um, to Austin. Yep. Hey. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Austin Branford. I'm counsel to the City Council's Committee on Housing and Building. And before we start, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, as I'll be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. During the hearing, if council members have questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I'll call you in order. When called upon, please be sure to let us know to whom your questions are directed so they can be unmuted too. We'll be limiting council member questions to four minutes, including responses. Our first panelists will be Mike McKee, Barika Williams, Karen Schreiber, and Andy Morrison. I will call you when it's your turn to speak and your testimony will be limited to three minutes. A sergeant at arms will keep your timer, will keep a timer and let you know when to begin and when your time is up. This panel will be, will be followed by council member questions. We will then hear testimony from the administration, which will be followed by additional council member questions. Finally, we will hear public testimony. We will now start with our first panelist, Mike McKee, who will be followed by Barika Williams. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Hi, Mike. Uh, your clock will begin when you start your testimony. Sorry. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Michael McKee. I'm a treasurer of the Tenants Political Action Committee. Uh, I want to make it clear that I'm testifying only behalf of myself and Tenants PAC, not of, on behalf of any other organization. Um, we are very much in support of these two pieces of legislation. Uh, they are important pieces of the puzzle, um, but I want to parenthetically uh, wish Corey a happy birthday. Uh, I also want to thank the council for getting back to work and showing how it can be done. And we are very much hoping that the state legislature will follow your lead. And just as somebody who's been cooped up for seven weeks, I'm gonna thank the council for taking the leadership on opening our city streets to pedestrians. Um, Intro 1912 and Intro 1936 are important pieces of what is needed uh, to protect tenants, um, but it's not everything that we need. As many of you know, and as we have discussed, uh, the ultimate thing we need is some kind of cancellation or forgiveness of rent. We are now facing a situation where literally hundreds of thousands of tenants all across New York State and across the country simply cannot pay rent through no fault of their own because they've lost their income. When the courts reopen and when eviction moratoria are lifted, uh, we're gonna be in a situation where a lot of these people are gonna be facing eviction and displacement. Um, and that's why it's important that we get uh, rent cancellation in addition to these other measures. Very, very glad to see that for people uh, affected by COVID-19, that protection of against eviction will continue into next spring, uh, and we commend you for that. Want to emphasize that we are talking about canceling rents, canceling mortgage payments, and canceling utilities. Uh, and we do believe that mom and pop landlords need relief as well as tenants. Uh, we think the big landlords like Blackstone can take a haircut. Uh, they can certainly absorb this um, uh, situation for several months. Um, I am a volunteer on a hotline sponsored by the Met Council on Housing. Um, and until two or three months ago, almost all of the calls were, how do I get repairs done? How do I force my landlord to fix something? Things like that. The last six weeks, the calls have all been about, I can't pay the rent. I'm out of a job. I've lost hours. I'm, my income has been reduced. My income has been eliminated. What do I do? We've also had a lot of calls from tenants who want to break their lease because they can't afford to pay the rent anymore. And of course, one thing we know is that New York state law on breaking a lease is very bad. Uh, we're hoping to get some relief uh, once the state legislature goes back into business. Time expired. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. We will now hear from Varika Williams, who will be followed by Karen Schreiber. Uh, wait, what, one second, um, I just want to acknowledge the presence of Fernando Cabrera and Carlina Rivera. And Barika, your time will start when you begin your testimony. Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you, Speaker Johnson, and happy birthday, I should also add. Um, thank you to Chair Cornegie, um, uh, to Chair Cohen. Uh, it's nice to see all of you back in my new role as ED at a &HD, and I'm sorry that we haven't gotten to interact except for remotely. Um, uh, you all know, many of you all know a &HD and our work on behalf of 80 plus uh, nonprofits, tenants groups, and CDCs across the city. Um, we've fought for decades against uh, harassment of tenants, many of which are things that we've accomplished in partnership with uh, the city council and specifically with many of the people uh, on this Zoom call. Um, and ensuring that all tenants are protected against harassment, especially during these challenge ta challenging times is incredibly important. We cannot stress how much. Um, the stress of the pandemic, of living through this, of losing people, of losing family members, of struggling through health is only made more complicated when tenants are facing harassment and displacement um, and facing harassment and displacement in a moment where that really compromises your safety and the safety of your family. Um, so we fully support uh, expanding the definition of harassment to include threats based on persons having um, been impacted by COVID, uh, the intro of 1936, 2020. Um, absolutely looking forward to and happy to continue to work with the city council to pass uh, this legislation and to expand these protections. 
um, we really appreciate the intention behind, behind 1912 um, and really applaud the city using its authority um, over sheriffs and marshals to prevent evictions um, in, in this time um, and during this current moratorium. We do have a few concerns with the bill as currently drafted, um, and that's because many of ANHD's members are nonprofits, our CDCs, um, who have been their community caretakers, been on the front lines um, throughout all of this. Um, and while tenants in these buildings are often struggling, they absolutely need relief. We have a lot of concerns about pushing and extending the loss of rental income onto the very nonprofits who are trying to support their communities throughout this. Um, we know that statewide, two thirds of the folks who filed for unemployment earned $40,000 or less. So that is really the tenants that um, mainly reside in our buildings and in communities. And we really just don't wanna end up in a place where the extension of anything means that there is a loss of services or that that burden falls back on, on our nonprofits that we're gonna need um, because we're desperately gonna need the affordable housing um, coming out of this into the long, the very long-term work of recovery. So it's just uh, to, to um, piggyback some on what Mike and Key said, we can't substitute meaningful rent relief. Time has expired. Um, okay. Um, but just to say, we, we want to absolutely make this a priority for all levels of government. Thank you. Uh, we, thank you, Marika. Before we go to the next panelist, I'd also like to acknowledge that there are at least uh, four or five of my colleagues who have been here since the beginning of the hearing. I neglected to go to my second screen uh, to see that they were there. Uh, Barry Gridenchik. Mark Jonai, Keith Powers, and Helen Rosenthal have been here from the beginning. I just neglected to go to the second screen and see them. Welcome. Thank you. We will now hear from Karen Schreiber, who will be followed by Andy Morrison. Karen? Hey, Karen, your time will start when you begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chairpersons Carnegie and Cohen and members of the committees for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Legal Aid Society the nation's oldest and largest not-for-profit legal services organization. We welcome this opportunity to endorse and share our view on this legislation. Um, and we commend the committees for holding today's hearings on both bills, which will provide relief to numerous New Yorkers who are currently on the edge of homelessness and financial distress. We strongly support the passage of the bills and have some suggested recommendations to strengthen the legislation. We strongly support the passage of intro 1912 um, which will temporarily halt the taking and restitution of property and the execution of money judgments. As you are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic is causing devastating and lasting economic hardship that disproportionately impacts low and moderate income New Yorkers and communities of color. This has caused numerous low, low and moderate income New Yorkers to default or fall behind on financial obligations. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified New York City's ongoing housing, housing crisis in ways that are impossible to ignore. Housing insecurity is a brutal fact of life for many New Yorkers. 44% um, of New York City renters are rent burdened and four out of 10 low income people in New York are either homeless or severely rent burdened. A budget overwhelmed by housing costs increases a family's risk of food insecurity, lack of access to proper medical care and eviction. And with little room for savings, a reduction in work hours or an unexpected expense may cause turmoil and ultimately displacement. And similar to the COVID-19 pandemic, Involuntary displacement is not born equally in New York City, where low-income Black and Latinx households are most impacted by eviction and homelessness. Housing insecurity now impacts a far broader range of households than it did earlier this year. Um, for low and moderate income renters on the precipice, rent burdened and without savings, um, they have now fallen off of a financial cliff. While New Yorkers are right now protected from eviction by Governor Cuomo's 90-day statewide eviction moratorium, the economic landscape is unlikely to be dramatically altered by the end of the state's moratorium on June 20th. By June 20th, renters will owe months of rent arrears and fees. Many will promptly face eviction proceedings seeking thousands of dollars of debt and dispossession. Far from solving the crisis, the end of this short-term moratorium will be catastrophic for renters. The eviction of any one household is a tragedy and the eviction of thousands of renter households is a humanitarian crisis. The consequences of eviction are vast and have devastating long-term negative impacts. Um, similarly, New Yorkers face financial challenges beyond eviction um, and the hardships imposed by money judgments are equally as devastating for um, individual judgment debtors and communities at large. 
Um, an increasing number of judgment debtors have contacted the Legal Aid Society in the last few weeks seeking assistance due to frozen bank accounts and garnished wages. So we suggest, while we support the legislation, we have a few suggestions um, that will further reduce the harm, including clarifying um, how expired. to- Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We'll now hear from Andy Morrison and open up for council member questions. Andy. Andy, your time will begin when you start your testimony. Thank you, Chairs Cohen and Cornegy and members of the committees for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Andy Morrison and I'm campaigns director at New Economy Project and many of you know us and our work. We're an economic justice organization that works with community groups uh, and low income New Yorkers throughout New York City. We strongly support intro 1912. We urge the committee to take swift action to move the bill forward so that the full body can pass it into law as soon as possible. And we commend uh, Speaker Johnson and other sponsors of this emergency legislation for their leadership. We have been calling uh, for several weeks now for a statewide emergency moratorium on predatory debt collection. And we're very pleased that in the absence of state level action, members of the council are taking this crucial step to protect New Yorkers at New Economy Project, we run a, a free legal hotline for low-income New Yorkers, and we've heard over the years from thousands of New Yorkers who have been harmed by discriminatory and abusive debt collection. And since COVID-19 gripped our city, we've been flooded with a new spate of calls from low-income New Yorkers who are being hounded by debt collectors. Um, it should just go without saying that no New Yorker should be having his or her bank accounts uh, frozen or wages garnished. And... As, this, as debt collectors continue to siphon wealth from New Yorkers and from communities, the debt, predatory debt collection has morphed into a public health crisis. Um, and so we really need this action to further and ensure economic and racial justice and community equity. A lot of the New Yorkers we've heard from have been speaking out and sharing their stories. And I just want to read one testimonial from a Brooklyn resident named Veronica and refer you to our written testimony where we've included several others. Quote, I just found out that my paycheck was garnished. I don't know what it's for. I can't afford to have any money taken away right now. My two daughters and two grandchildren live with me. I'm trying to support my family, but everything is uncertain. My job has cut the number of days that I go into work for safety reasons. One of my daughters lost her job because of coronavirus. That money was taken from me, could have gone toward a lot of other things that I'm worried, right, worried about right now, like food, disinfecting supplies, and other things I need to keep my family healthy. Stories like this underscore the need for bold action. Um, and as we, as we address this issue in the immediate term, uh, we also want to underscore the need to be thinking about the structural inequities that underlie this crisis from lack of health care to housing insecurity and discrimination built into our financial system. So in addition to addressing this issue in the immediate term, which we urge the council to do right away, um, we also want to encourage the council to be thinking about broader measures, including debt cancellation and other more structural solutions to our unequal economy. Time Thank has you. expired. Thank you, Andy. We'll now open it up to questions from Speaker Johnson, Chair Hornigy, and Chair Cohen before moving to general council member questions. Thank you, Austin. It's good to see you. I hope you're safe and healthy. Um, let me, give me one moment. So I wanted to uh, start off uh, for uh, anyone on the panel and I wanna thank you for the work that you're doing. You've really been at the forefront on these issues and even though two thirds of New Yorkers are renters, they certainly aren't getting two thirds of the help. We've seen a lot more support be announced for uh, landlords and mortgage holders. And we have to make sure as this hearing's about that we're not leaving uh, tenants behind. It's government's job to solve this problem. There have been devastating personal impact for many New Yorkers but this crisis also threatens the city's budget. If people aren't able to pay their rent, uh, we will see a drop in property tax revenue. And if people can't afford to pay their bills, we will see less spending. And that means less money in sales tax revenue. All of that means less money for the social safety net, which we need more than ever right now. So the council is doing what we can, but we're gonna need more help. 
I've been advocating for a lot more money from the federal government, and we need uh, the state uh, to cancel rent, as we've seen in these bills, but they're calling for money from the feds as well. So I want everyone watching to understand how serious this is. Can each one of you talk about what you think will happen if we don't figure this out, if New Yorkers who need help with rent don't get it? And maybe we could start with uh, Mike McKee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I think we're facing, um, I, I forget which witness it was said this is a humanitarian crisis. I mean, that's exactly what this is going to be. Um, there's going to come a point when the courts reopen and when these moratoria on eviction are lifted, uh, where literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if you look at it statewide or nationwide, of tenants who just can't pay the rent um, are going to be facing displacement. And, and another issue is that the courts are simply going to be overwhelmed. Uh, with eviction cases. Right now, landlords cannot file new eviction cases, but at some point they will be allowed to do that. Um, this is all gonna pile up. Um, so there has to be money from the federal government targeted specifically to housing and rent relief. There has to be a cancellation of rent. It's my view that at some point, Andrew Cuomo is going to end his stonewalling on this issue and recognize that something must be done. And that if you don't just cancel the rent and then figure out how to take care of mom and pop landlords while you're doing that, and as Barika pointed out, nonprofit landlords have special needs too, and they don't gouge their tenants. So they're really running at a very um, low margin, if any. Um, this all has to be done and it is government's job to do it. And if it isn't done, uh, it's going to be a disaster. And I don't think, I don't think ultimately government or the courts are going to sit by and let that happen. I cannot imagine most judges presiding over eviction after eviction after eviction, uh, human nature being what it is and judges being who they are. I would suspect they're going to be pressuring landlords and tenants to come to some kind of settlement, possibly where tenants pay some of the rent if they can. I don't know maybe some kind of fund to, to help make this up. But it's, it's, I think it's a very dangerous and, si and serious situation that we just can't ignore. Uh, and I think that by not talking about it now and by basically stonewalling it on it, the governor is creating a lot of fear and anxiety. Uh, and um, I think it's time that everyone in state government, our friends in the state legislature and the governor recognize that this is a serious issue that has to be addressed. The city can only do so much. Uh, and I think it's commendable that you're doing what you're doing. Uh, but if we don't have federal and state government weighing in on this, nothing, we're not gonna be able to deal with this. It's not gonna, it's not gonna, be, it's not gonna be a solution that's gonna keep people in their homes. I, I'm not gonna uh, let, um, I have other questions and I wanna get through them quickly because we have a lot of council members on. I wanna go to ANHD. Uh, you all have been ringing the alarm for weeks. Your analysis has shown this crisis is hitting black and brown working class neighborhoods the hardest. I know you are certainly seeing this when it comes to tenants' loss of income and the inability to pay rent. What are you all seeing on the ground with respect to small businesses, vendors, particularly immigrant-owned businesses? Uh, thank you for that, Speaker Johnson. I mean, uh, we as we've seen for so many people, we've seen um, our immigrant and black and brown uh, businesses are the hardest hit. Many of them were unbanked or underbanked before. Um, and so there has been a lot of conversation, a lot of work at the federal level um, because many of these uh, small businesses have been entirely shut out, if not by process shut out of the federal aid. Um, but it also feeds into the side of things that is residential tenants and the broader community supports, because oftentimes these are businesses that are tied to some of our residential buildings. They're the businesses that are supporting people's incomes. Obviously, the longer they stay shut and impacted, the more we're impacting people's earnings. And so this all ultimately gets tied together. Um, one of the things we're hearing on the ground from um, many of our members is really the to, to put the human side on it as Mike McHugh is talking about 
really being confronted with the challenge of because their government is not stepping in because at the city, at the state, at the federal, and I know you all are, are limited in how much you can do and what you're able to do in this, but there hasn't been a, a clear um, approach and relief package for um, residential tenants. And so what these landlords are being confronted with is going to tenants that they know have lost their jobs, know that their businesses aren't open because they're around the corner, know that they're not able to help them get a loan with the bank that they have a relationship with, and then also being faced with having to knock on their door and ask them, what can we do about rent? And, and our groups really don't wanna be put in that position, right? At the end of this, at down the line, what we're looking at is if we do not figure out a rent relief package in some way, shape or form, we are looking at an explosion of our homeless population an explosion in our human services needs because everyone, if we've got, we've got tons of people going to food banks now, but where will we be then? And what little um, interge intergenerational wealth that we have built for immigrant communities and black and brown communities will be absolutely wiped out. Um, and as we kick this down the road, as we go from four months worth of rent at a $1,400 rent is like $5,600. Most families don't have um, most families don't have more than $400 or $700 in savings. So there's no possibility, and that savings they're already burning through. So the likelihood that they are able to take and, and pay that back, even over a, a one-year timeline, is just incredibly slim. So right. what we're really talking about is creating like a, a long-term debt burden for people that they know they'll never get out of. Thank you, thank you, Bruga. I want to go to legal aid uh, for a quick question. Uh, there, th this crisis is uh, deepening the inequalities that you just heard about that we had even before uh, coronavirus hit our city. Low-income communities of color are taking the brunt of the health impacts, and if we don't do more to help with debt and rent, we're going to see the irreversible economic impacts that Barika just spoke about. Can you talk about what you're seeing on the ground? What are your clients facing in terms of economic hardships? How important is taking care of the rent issue in terms of helping New Yorkers out? Um, thank you for that question, Speaker Johnson. It is um, helping renters in this city is of the utmost importance right now. As, um, as the other witnesses have said, um, people are struggling and they will be struggling even further um, come June, come this fall. Um, the rent continues to accrue and people are terrified. That's, that's what we are seeing. Um, we are seeing people hearing from clients who don't know how they will pay their rent in May, don't know how they will pay their rent in June and going forward. Um, they are preparing for and resigning themselves to having to leave their homes, which has, as I mentioned before, very dramatic negative effects on employment outcomes, school performance, and, and physical and mental health. Um, the, we appreciate the, um, the city council's recognition of this, of this tremendous need. Um, and we hope that the state and federal governments will, um, will do more here because we are faced with a reckoning. And come June, we will see tenants brought to housing court um, on a tremendous scale and a scale that the courts will not be able to handle and that the city's infrastructure will not be able to handle. And um, there, right on that point, I just want to hear Legal Aid's thought on this. There are two temporary eviction moratoriums that could apply to New Yorkers right now. There's the state's 90-day moratorium, and then there's the 120-day federal moratorium that applies to properties with a federally-backed mortgage. Does it seem like tenants and even landlords understand what protections apply to them or their tenants? Um, unfortunately, I, I, think, I think no, they don't. Um, we are hearing from our partners around the country, too, that um, the federal moratorium is causing a lot of confusion um, or um, well, confusion, I guess, um, for landlords who don't realize that um, people cannot be evicted for nonpayment um, if they reside in a property that um, has a, as you said, Mr. Speaker, a federally subsidized um, mortgage or has another subsidy attached. Um, these um, that federal moratorium covers a certain portion of, um, of tenants and other renters 
um, from again, eviction for non-payment um, through the end of July, um, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, it seems to relate again, only to non-payment proceedings, leaving open other types of proceedings where non-payment could be an issue, but is not explicitly stated. Um, and further, it's only, um, I believe less or a little bit more than 30 days longer than the current state moratorium. So even if more than half um, of New York City's renters are covered by the federal moratorium, come the end of July, we will see the same thing um, that we'll see at the end of June likely. Thank you. I have more questions, but I wanna go back to the chairs so that they can get through some of their questions and then we'll go to the council members. I can come back later to ask the rest of my questions for this panel. So I turn it back to uh, either Chair Cornegy or Chair Cullen. Uh, thank you, uh, um, Speaker Johnson. Um, both Barika and Mike have alluded to um, this fine line that has to be drawn and the governor has to be involved with um, while protecting, you know, sm uh, tenants, uh, small homeowners as well, not, not burdening them. Um, and it's, it's a delicate balance. As the chair of this committee, I'm also faced with doing that and, and, acute, and I'm acutely aware that the uh, input of the state and federal government in doing that is, is essential. Um, I just wanted to ask, statistically, do you know the ratio between uh, big buildings and big building owners uh, as, as, ten, as landlords as compared to small homeowners? I had heard that there's a statistic that there actually may be more small owners, small homeowners responsible for the makeup of tenancy than it actually is big buildings. I just wanted to know, I, I know you guys probably, the two of you, I know you probably know. I'm just curious as to what that is. Marika, you wanna go first or? Um, I, I mean, uh, I actually don't know that number off the top of my head, but I could probably get it for you in about two minutes. So if you give me a second, um, council member, I can pull that. But I also would say one thing that's a little bit challenging here is that sometimes it's not a clean break between the size of the building, it's really about the, the type of owner, right? Yeah. We've seen um, big investment firms and specifically hedge firms, um, hedge company, hedge firm companies buy up a series of buildings across an entire neighborhood, but these are one to four family homes. So Bushwick is one of the places that's been rampant for this. We want to treat them who have investors and backers and reserves very differently than the understanding of a first time home buyer who is likely being supported by some of the groups that you will hear from today, Impact, Chaya, right, CNYC, and some of these groups that are really trying to build new home ownership across the city. Um, and part of their ability to pay for the mortgage is that first time homeowner collecting rent or in one or two units of somebody that they know and they have a relationship with and they're trying to support their tenant. Those are two very different things. Um, and the hard thing is that by slicing it just by stock, they kind of get blurred together. So I, I, uh, Mike, before you, before you chime in. Well, I, 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 I don't have exact numbers for you, but we can certainly uh, dig that up. The data show very clearly that the majority of rent stabilized apartments in New York City are owned by large landlords. There's no question about that. But it's also true that a majority of owners are small landlords who own one or two buildings. Um, and as Barika pointed out, there are small landlords and there are small landlords. Uh, and in fact, one of the thing predatory uh, investors have done in the aftermath of the 2008 uh, economic crisis is they went around the country and bought up mobile home parks and they bought up even single family homes that had been foreclosed and turned them into rental properties where they are gouging and and evicting people. Uh, so the, the mere size of the building is not uh, what you need to look at. You need some kind of uh, sit system where you can actually ascertain who people are. Just for example, there's a very famous landlord uh, from Brooklyn who comes to the Rent Guidelines Board every year and testifies that he's a small landlord. Well, when he started out doing this back in the 1980s, he owned one 20 unit building. He now owns nine 20 unit buildings, all rent stabilized. Of course, now he has some deregulated apartments uh, thanks to Peter Vallone and thanks to George Pataki. But, um, you know, he's done very well under rent stabilization. 
He owns uh, 180, uh, nine times 20, 180 apartments. And he's, he bought these new buildings while he was running his original stabilized building. So it's, it's not cut and dried and you can't simply um, go by the size of the building. Uh, you have to go by pattern of ownership uh, and other factors, um, but we can certainly uh, we can certainly prepare numbers for you that will help you understand who owns what. Well, I, I appreciate that, but I also know that it's very difficult to do that because as you mentioned, you have um, these hedge funds who are operating as individual uh, LLCs to some degree. So trying to, trying to get the cumulative effect of their buying power sometimes is difficult. We've tried to look into, but you know, LLCs federally are protected from who the owners are. So we know that that's happening as well. Um, I just want to be mindful uh, because there are some small homeowners who, while will while their tenants will be getting uh, uh, some help and some relief, they still are subject to rising energy costs and things like that. That kind of make it difficult. So, uh, you know, I, I'm just I'm in a precarious position. I'm screaming at the governor, just like you guys are, because we need help. We need to be able to disseminate, you know, who's who. That's going to be very important to do. And we don't have a whole bunch of time to do it. So I look forward to working with that, the entire first panel to make sure that we can tease some of this apart and target those that we need to target and support and help those that we need to help in terms of uh, uh, homeowners and or landlords. So we got to walk and chew gum at the same time. Andy? Uh, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, uh, Mike, uh, you, uh, in your testimony, you, you talked about calls that you're, you're, that you're taking now uh, as, a, as a volunteer. Can you, what do you tell tenants who call now who, are, who can't pay the rent? Was Mike able to hear me? I'm sorry, my internet is apparently unstable. I keep getting this prompt <laughs> saying your internet is, connection is unstable. So I heard part of what you said, council member. What I was wondering is what do you, you, you said that you are volunteering and taking calls from tenants. I'm just curious, what are you telling tenants today who call and say they can't pay their rent? Um, well, you have to deal with it first as a matter of common sense. It's a question between feeding your family and paying the landlord. There's no choice, you have to feed your family. Uh, I do tell people that if you can put aside some of the rent, um, uh, you should do that uh, because down the road, uh, just the ability to pay partial rent might be useful in terms of individual uh, negotiations in a landlord uh, tenant proceeding. Uh, but there of course are people who can't do even that. Um, and, um, it's, you know, we refer people to local community groups. We refer people to lawyers when they need a lawyer. Um, um, it's, there's not a lot you can tell people except that, you know, hunker down and get through this and stay safe. Uh, you can't tell people to save money when they don't have an income. Um, but it, it all matters. It all depends on the uh, individual situation when you talk to the tenant who's calling in. Uh, we also have resources that we refer people to. I think we, we lost Mike again. Uh, there are even more who won't be able to pay on May 1st. And there are other tenants who can pay, but who are going to withhold rent uh, out of solidarity, um, which I have no problems with if they want to do that. Uh, but ultimately, this has to be a government solution. Uh, briefly, uh, 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 Karen Treiber from Legal Aid. In your testimony also, you said that you had some suggestions on possibly improving the bill. I don't know if you submitted written testimony in which those suggestions were made. Otherwise, uh, I'm interested in them. Can we unmute legal aid? Thank You're you. You're unmuted. Yes, thank you for that question. Um, we did submit written testimony that um, outlined some of our recommendations. I was out of time and was unable to get to them. If we um, have them for the record, that's fine. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Mr. Chair. All right. Uh, thank you, Rob. Austin, I'm done. 
All right, any more questions for Speaker Johnson? No, we can go to the other members. I can come back after them. I don't want to hold up the other members who are waiting. Okay, sounds good. So I'll now call on council members to ask questions in the order they have used the Zoom raised hand function. I'd like to also note that council members Torres, Yeager, and Powers have already raised their hands to ask questions of the administration after their testimony. Council members, please keep your questions to four minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of question, council members' questions will be limited to two minutes. A sergeant at arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. Our first questions will come from Councilmember Yeager, followed by Councilmember Cabrera. And Councilmember Yeager, your clock will start when you begin your, your uh, testimony. Well, I'm not testifying. I'm a member of the council. Oh. How are you? Come Thank you. Um, first of all, I'd, I'd like to echo Mr. Speaker. Uh, I, I agree with the portion of his opening statement that says that uh, we do need rent cancellations. We do need reductions. I also believe, as uh, Mr. McGee said, um, and, and Mike McGee has been a leader in tenant advocacy, so this is an important point from him, that that has to go hand in hand with relief for, um, for landlords, and particularly small landlords. I'm not worried about the very large landlords. I am worried about the small landlords. Excuse me, I have some background noise. Um, but I, I, my question, um, uh, more importantly, is, is to, uh, um, Ms. Schreiber, and since you're the only lawyer on the panel, I wanted to ask you this question with regard to introduction 1912. Um, my understanding, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, the authority of a sheriff or a marshal to execute a judgment comes from state law. Um, and state law, particularly the CPLR with respect to executions when a sheriff receives it, uh, contain the word shall. Uh, do you believe that the city council has the authority to supersede state law and to replace the word shall when a sheriff receives uh, lawfully uh, received and executed income execution or, or money judgment execution or a warrant? So um, thank you very much for that question, Council Member Yeager. Um, we believe, um, well, with regard to city marshals specifically, that um, the mayor has the authority to direct city marshals to stop enforcement um, of, of judgments and that um, the city council has the power to legislate here as a result. Okay, and that the city council, notwithstanding the fact that uh, if, a, if a judge or a clerk of the court or an officer of the court signs an execution that says at the top, the people of the state of New York to any sheriff or marshal and gives it to a sheriff, the sheriff can put it aside because we passed the law that says so? I think, that the sheriff would not necessarily would not be placing the judgment aside indefinitely. Um, it could be ex it will be executed. Let's say not could it, it will be executed when the moratorium is lifted, um, and the uh, and it would not be um, going flying in the face of state law to say that that judgment is going to be. Um, paused, uh, for lack of a better word, um, for now, until such time has passed that it makes sense for the community at large for judgments to resume being ex being um, enforced. I appreciate that very much. Well, the sheriff is going to come on and testify in a little while, and, and I'm interested in hearing his opinion on this topic. Uh, but I appreciate uh, all of the advocates who came today and the important work that you do um, of the lawyers who are on the front line and, and Mike McGee, who's a legend in uh, tenant rights and tenant defenses. And um, I'm a tenant too, and you know I can pay my rent, so I'm going to, and I will, um, but there are a lot of people who are suffering right now and can't. And I'm gonna use the remaining uh, clock that the sergeant has at 40 seconds to say that I do believe there are things that the city council can do to relieve the burden on, on the owners uh, in addition to the tenants, because they, it can't just be uh, that tenants stop paying rent simply because uh, we say so, and um, notwithstanding that they're not able to afford it. Tenants who don't pay rent and can't afford it will never be able to make that up, and that's going to leave a hole. We have to do it, we have to do it on both ends. We have to help the tenants and freeze their rent, and we also have to help the landlords, and we can do it on taxation. We can do something to relieve the tax burden by uh, stopping the interest payments on late payments. I'm my this short charge. Um, we can stop the interest on late payments uh, and allow the, the uh, owners 
to have a little bit of float so that they don't have the proverbial gun to their head on making payments at the same time that they're not receiving an income. So that's why your advocacy on this, Mike, is, is so important because you're recognizing that it does come from both ends. We can't just stop it on one end. We do also have to help those people who have those 20 unit buildings before they get the other eight uh, 20 unit buildings. Uh, and so I wanna thank you all. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Cabrera, followed by Councilmember Powers. And your clock will start now. Thank you so much. First, I wanna wish uh, our speaker a super happy birthday. Um, the Lord bless you and give you many, many more years. Thank I want to thank you. Uh, indeed. Uh, and also, I want to thank uh, the speaker, the chairs, for being so parsimonious with your questions uh, to get to the rest of us. We, we, I know I can speak on behalf of my colleagues. We really, truly appreciate it. Uh, my question is in regards, does it make, uh, I have a couple of questions real quick. Does it make more sense to have the state and the city come up with a fund that pays for those who are struggling with the rent, for those who were unemployed, we know the full list. There are people who are employed. There are people who actually made more money than ever, but we have a big segment that is in, in big in a tremendous need. Doesn't it make more sense to have the state and the city come up with a fund to pay for those rent, just like Delaware, this is not unprecedented. The state of Delaware pay for the rent for all the renters. My second question, because I know I'm gonna run out of time, is that if the nonprofits uh, organizations are excluded, uh, wouldn't it make also sense to include those landlords, they have the same business plan, they have the same agreements with HPD, uh, when it comes to, you know, many of them, they had Title 11, uh, there were agreements in place uh, to be able to have uh, low rent. And also, uh, the last thing is uh, uh, Assemblywoman Ness Dinkin, I was in a meeting the other day, she was very much afraid of landlords, of minority-owned landlords uh, that are, could essentially be wiped out uh, if they're not able to collect rent and we could see pretty much the end of a generation of minorities uh, who own property. So here trying to find that balance, which I know is, is very difficult. So I'll turn it over uh, uh, to the panel uh, for some wisdom. Uh, so I think uh, this is Barika. I think I can pick up on the, the minority landlords um, and CDCs. I think we see those as being interrelated. Um, we do have some large um, landlords who are minority owned, but by and large, that's rarer in the city. Um, I was able to pull those numbers. Um, and just so folks know, I think it's about 13% of uh, buildings of landlords own one building or less in New York City. Um, as compared to 27% that own um, uh, 61 buildings or more. So that's sort of the, the spread that we're talking about. It's relatively few buildings that are owned by small landlords. Um, but in both cases, when it comes to CDCs, when it comes to some of our um, uh, community controlled like uh, CLTs or, or our limited equity co-ops, and then also our um, MWBE developers, um, they've face slightly different challenges. Um, our affordable housing um, have so many regulations that are put on them by HPD, but also at the federal level that dictate their contracts, what they can collect in rents, um, but also what they can charge, um, how much they can have in reserves. Um, and so there's, they don't have the ability to sort of pull in from other buildings and other, other locations. Likewise, though, there are concerns similarly for um, uh, our minority uh, developers and landlords sometimes because we do know that they are underbanked and often underserved as part of loans and they get higher rates. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Councilmember. Um, the next person is going to be Councilmember Powers followed by Councilmember Kuh. But first, I want to remind everyone to identify to whom your questions are directed so they can be unmuted too. Councilmember Powers. And your clock will start now. 
Great, thank you. Uh, happy birthday, Mr. Speaker. I hope you're enjoying it. And uh, thanks everybody for your testimony and everybody viewing at home. Hope everybody is safe and healthy. Um, uh, this is directed to any members of the panel. I guess I can start with Mike McKee, but other folks are obviously uh, helpful to join in. I, I want to echo some of the comments I made earlier. I do, do think that it's important that we, at the, at the state and local level, yeah, you know, ensure that folks are not being evicted at this point in time based on loss of income or inability to move out of an apartment. There's just so many reasons why we need to make sure that people have some housing stability always, but particularly right now. Um, I am concerned that we are, um, uh, we are also should be providing people with the ability and a better ability to pay the rent in the meantime, which is good for all stakeholders that we're talking about here. And, um, you know, we put out some proposals, whether, um, and, and suggested some things like flexibility in terms of how to use your security deposit to be able to pay the next month's rent. Well, obviously that only covers one month, but, you know, to give you a bridge in the time period that we're talking about. To, you, my landlord has offered rent deferral programs to be able to pay part of your rent or just to be able to push some a, a month's rent back and pay later, which also has some concerns, but um, enhance, enhance rent programs, things around SCREE to enhance the SCREE program for people in need. Um, for me, it's really important that we also make sure people can find ways and creative ways to make sure that people have the ability to pay rent. And I'm, I'm, I wanted to hear ideas or thoughts on, uh, in addition to just an eviction moratorium, um, other ways that the city or state can be uh, interceding to, uh, to help people be able to pay the rent and what creative measures we might be able to employ right now to um, not just just shift the onerous over to those uh, who own properties, some who are mom and pop, some who are large, but to actually assist with the tenant's ability to pay right now. Um, well, that's a mouthful. Um, it's a mouthful, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm not sure which part of the question. Uh, well, well, just, to, just other ideas. I mean, ideas. I, I, if I could back up just a little bit, Council Member, I think sure. we all need to acknowledge that during the 25 years that we had vacancy decontrol in effect and other deregulation amendments, and I want to remind you that it was not the Republicans in Albany who first stuck us with permanent vacancy decontrol. It was the Democrats in the New York City Council in 1994 under the leadership of Speaker Peter Vallone. Uh, but during that 25 years that we had vacancy decontrol and other weakening amendments in effect, most of which were repealed last year, thank God. Um, there was a huge hit on affordability uh, to housing, not just rent regulated housing, but housing in general in the downstate region. Uh, and we are still living with the effects of that hit on affordability. Rents are much less affordable now than they were 25 years ago. 25 years ago, no one thought that $2,000 a month would be uh, a normal rent uh, in Brooklyn or Queens. In fact, council member after council member that we were trying to convince to vote against Peter Vallone's decontrol bill from Brooklyn, Queens and the Bronx all said, quote, I don't have any apartments in my district renting for $2,000 a month, end quote. And we said just pass this bill and wait 10 years and you will. Now, who was right? Were we right or were they right? I rest my case. But there are a whole bunch of things that could be done. We won a lot of things last year, but we did not get everything we need. There was no rent rollback. Time expired. The apartments that were deregulated were not re-regulated and we did not get good cause eviction uh, passed for small buildings. Those are all things that need to be done. I, 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 but I, Mike and, and amen. Uh, and I certainly don't have any apartments I've rent less than 2000, I think at this point in my district, but I'm just wondering if there are things right now you think that we are, or legal aid or ANHC others that we should be doing in addition to, uh, uh, extending an eviction moratorium, just in terms of flexibility. We, I, you know, so I see others raising their hand. I think Barika had her hand up too. So if you want to pop in. Um, no, at, at Council Member Powers, I'm, and we're happy to have those conversations and, and work with you on some of those ideas. There's been conversations around things like, um, waiving security deposits and allowing tenants to use them around accessing reserves, um, around letting tenants amortize their rent over the following year to break a current lease early without a penalty. 
Um, I, I, but I think the what some of what Mike is talking about, but I think sort of our larger point and push, and this is why it's important um, for Councilmember Cabrera's earlier question of it's important for everybody to understand understand the scale and volume. So if we were talking about there's three point almost 3.5 million rental units in just the city, um, assuming that they rent at just a thousand dollars a piece, which is a low ball number. So you know I'm rounding this down um, and assuming that people can't pay for three months, that's uh, over a half a that's nearly that's a half a billion dollar price tag right there. Right, so I think it's just um, it, it's it's key for us to all sort of understand what volume we're expecting, and that's with just five percent of people not being able to pay their rent for three months. Uh, thank you. I'll I'll give my time back. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Koo, who will be followed by Councilmember Torres. Councilmember Koo. Councilmember Koo, your clock is up now. Thank you. Happy birthday, Speaker. And I want to thank every one of you coming to testify today. Uh, and, and I support the spirit and the intent of uh, intro 1912 and 1926. Uh, but I have uh, a few questions uh, for the first panel. Uh, you mentioned people have no jobs and they have no money to pay for the rent. But I thought we have this uh, unemployment insurance. Everyone have uh, money coming from the state. And on top of that, the federal government is giving $600 per week uh, to those who collect unemployment. So just a rough estimate, an average worker, even though they are not working, if they collect uh, unemployment, they will get like $3,000 a month. So, uh, so, I mean, some of them might have uh, uh, other circumstances, but I think many of them are able to pay their rent. Uh, uh, if they are not able to pay the rent, where did the money go? If, if you have $3,000 a month uh, per month uh, from the government, and did you buy food and, uh, and you, buy, uh, you pay bills, and another point I want to raise is if everyone don't pay rent, all the landlords are going to go bankrupt. So what, how do we help the land, uh, all these uh, landlords, especially the small ones? Many landlords, they have, uh, they, they have their own uh, obligations. They have to pay mortgage, utilities, and property tax. And don't, don't forget, property tax is one third of the city revenues. If the landlords don't pay tax, the city will go bankrupt immediately. So we all have to, we all have to understand uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are good intentions, but then there are unintended consequences. Well, we don't want those uh, things to happen uh, to those uh, they are paying property tax to the city. And if they don't pay tax, the city will, will get broke in a minute. So can uh, any one of you answer those questions? Um, I'll I, take or... a stab at it, council yeah. member. Uh, first of all, just let me point out that most people who have filed for unemployment have yet to receive any benefits at all. In fact, there was a study that was released yesterday uh, by the Pew uh, Research uh, Outfit that found that 29% of Americans, this was a national survey, who filed unemployment claims in March have actually received uh, unemployment benefits, and that means 79, uh, 81%, 29, 71% have not, uh, plus $1,200 a month that the federal government has graciously granted to individuals. I mean, that's a joke. Um, so I, I don't really have any uh, response to your larger questions about what are we going to do to keep the housing market from collapsing, but Obviously, this has to be a government solution, and it's going to involve money. No, I, I thought that if they approve, they get they can get an unemployment retroactively. The day they apply, are they unemployed? Well, yeah, but they don't have it now. But what is soon they have a, a bunch of money coming. And I have I have a friend who's been trying to apply for unemployment for three weeks, and she can't get through. 
Uh, I mean, uh, Mike, the, uh, the other thing that I would add into this is that it's very clear that there are huge parts of New York City's population who are uneligible to even qualify for unemployment um, because of their um, documentation status, because they operated in a cash economy, because they were out of employment too long prior to this. So there's also a huge set of people who've been shut out, which is heavily our immigrant population and our black and brown population, which is the same set of populations that, um, and especially for our Asian population who have suffered from this crisis almost a full month before almost everybody else in the city, right? So I think there are some key things to, to that we know um, and we've heard are huge gaps in, in even that the one-time stimulus check or the $600 um, um, bump consistently. I know there are some others, I think I saw Karen, she, um, there are some others who can speak to this later. All right, thank you. Yeah. Next, we'll hear from Council Member Torres, followed by Council Member Lander. Again, a reminder to choose who you're directing your questions to so we can unmute them too. And your clock will start now. Thank you. I, I want to wish the speaker a happy birthday. I have a question about harassment. I'm curious to know from any of the advocates what cases of COVID-19 harassment have you seen on the ground? And do you think intro 1936 is sufficiently brought to capture those cases? And I'd be curious to know what suggestive revisions you have for the bill. Mike, do you wanna go ahead? Uh, Karen, I think maybe that's a better question for you. Sure, um, thank you for that question. Question, Councilmember Torres. Um, so, in terms of what we would recommend, it's um, just a suggestion that um, the bill could include um, an additional definition of a person impacted by COVID-19. Um, we propose including a catch-all provision for a person who may be impacted um, for the purposes of the legislation, but doesn't fall into one of the categories listed. Um, in terms of what we are seeing on the ground, um, we are hearing about um, harassment based on um, a perception of, of lost income or following, um, following a renter's attempts to discuss with a landlord um, that they have lost income and would like to set up some sort of certain sort of payment plan. Um, and, partic and in a particularly um, insidious turn because of the eviction moratorium that's currently in place, we believe that this, um, this harassment is going on to get tenants to um, in some way voluntarily, involuntarily move um, a way of a workaround around the, um, the current moratorium. Um, and we expect that um, this behavior will only escalate and get worse um, as the months go by and folks continue to be unable to pay some or all of the rent. And I'll just make one uh, general comment here. We're, as a city, we're facing a humanitarian crisis, a nightmare that poses a systemic risk to working families, to small property owners, to even the city, which disproportionately depends on, on property taxes. And, and as has been pointed out, you know, there's risk in freezing evictions without canceling rent. And there's risk in canceling rent without subsidizing it. And there's no, as far as I can tell, there's no means of subsidizing without federal intervention. And I'm pessimistic about the prospects for federal support. So in the absence of federal support, what's the exit strategy from this nightmare? It, for me, it's, it's, uh, there's a real quandary about how to move forward. I, I think your question is well taken and I don't think any of us has an answer. I mean, state and federal government have got to step up and it's gonna involve money. Yeah. And, you know, as Barika pointed out, there, we have thousands and thousands of people who don't qualify under any of these programs and they're gonna be left out in the cold, which is why we are calling for universal rent forgiveness or cancellation, not uh, means tested because if you have a means test gig workers and undocumented tenants yeah. they're going to be excluded and that's not right and, and it's worth pointing out that many working families have been slow to receive their stimulus checks because of underbanking not everyone has a bank account that allows for direct deposits right 
there, there are just infinite ways in which COVID-19 has brought to light deeper inequalities in America. But I, I thank you all for your testimony. Great. Next, we'll be hearing from Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Lewis. And Councilmember Lander, your clock will start now. Thank you very much to the chairs and I'll join in the birthday we, uh, wishes to the speaker. I'm gonna follow up on both of council member Torres's questions. And I guess first, um, Ms. Williams, first welcome to the council of sorts and uh, <laughs> your role. Um, you know, I think you said that you would uh, provide a little uh, data to the council. And I think actually this dialogue about how many New Yorkers and especially what percent of tenants roughly will not be eligible for unemployment insurance and federal stimulus would be really helpful here because it is true that part of the idea of unemployment insurance is to enable people to have the resources that they need to pay their, their bills. So it's taking too long. A lot of people won't get what they need, but as people start to get those and it is income replacement, you know, that puts people in, in, in something of a position to cover their expenses. But as you point out, there's a very high percentage of New Yorkers who will not be receiving any relief because of the callous xenophobic, like we just shouldn't let that sit as though that's like reasonable. What we have are a set of xenophobes running the Senate and the White House. And as a result, a whole set of hardworking New York families who just as much as every one of us on this call need a place to live and food to eat are going to have no relief. So I think it'd be helpful if you could just help us document what percent of New York tenants are being left out in the cold, because that is a piece of why New York City and New York State have an extra responsibility to step up and do something here. So is that something that you could that you could yeah, help with? Absolutely. And then I guess I do want to just ask a little. I, I understand, you know, Michael, you're right that we need federal intervention here, but I, I do think it's worth like going a little further on how we think about that. Because if what we're saying is some version of those of us that are lucky enough to still, you know, have our income can, you know, uh, pay rent and pay mortgage, but there's a whole lot of people who can't, and how that's going to work its way through the system. Like, it's not that hard to imagine that the Federal Reserve or a set of banking institutions in partnership with the federal government could actually imagine some reasonable guidelines so that, you know, where tenants can't pay and therefore where multifamily building owners with tenants who can't pay can't pay their mortgage, they can expect to relate to their lending institutions in a way that says, yes, we're like all in a shared crisis. Here's some set of provisions for how to deal with it in ways that don't put people on the streets. And uh, we haven't heard anything about that at the national level. I know that's not your job or the job of, of today's hearing, but I wonder, Barika, this is something that you, you know, you know the housing market and its interconnectedness pretty well. Like, can you just do a little more thinking with us, assuming we start the ball rolling with this legislation and we push it up to the state with the rent and mortgage moratorium legislation. What do we expect at the level above that to kind of hold our system together for the next year, not put people on the streets, but then still leave us a housing economy uh, as we move forward beyond that? So, I mean, I, I think uh, the, what, it's, what this bill and this legislation seem like they're doing is creating sort of a, a bubble around the New York City housing stock so that when we get to what in vernacular we're all calling the 91st day, which could be at 91 or could be at 120 or right, whatever day that that is. Um, so when we get to that 91st day, how are we not in a place where to Karen's point, we don't have you know thousands of people run in and file evictions, right? That that creates an enormous strain right there. So we wanna prevent that. But what we also need to ensure is that we're not delaying that a year out so that we're looking at having that same exact circumstance just maybe trickled out over a longer period of time or delayed a longer period of time. And I think that's where it goes to, okay, then what is the state going to be stepping in to do in the interim? And then what is the federal government going to be stepping in to do? And those solutions might not be the same for everybody, or they might not be the same depending on what point in time you're in whether it's you know one year out or six months out or two years out. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm pleased to sign on to both pieces of the, of the legislation being heard today with thanks to their sponsors. Great. Next we'll have Council Member Lewis followed by Council Member Chin. Council Member Lewis, your time will start now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, wanna wish 
Speaker Johnson, a very happy birthday. And thank you, Chairs uh, Cornegan and Cohen for hosting this um, hearing. Um, I'm getting a lot of emails from different small businesses in regards to this bill. So I'm, I'm assuming this question could go to uh, Karen or anyone on the first panel. But the question is um, for big businesses like King's Plaza, City Point, um, those locations are in Brooklyn. If they were, if they were to commence an action for eviction before New York, uh, before the New York on pause policy, are city marshals still um, prohibit, prohibited from um, evicting? And if so, how does 1912 help or hurt small businesses? Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member. Just so, um, just so I make I can make sure I understand your question. Um, um, will city marshals be able to evict currently, or if, um, or while the um, the state moratorium is in effect, or if uh, the 1912 moratorium was in effect? Just in, or or all three. Great. Oh, council member, I think I think you're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Thank you. Perfect. Um, currently, or during the uh, the New York on pause, were they able to evict after? Will they still be able, able to evict if they already had commenced action um, beforehand? And how does 1912 help or hurt the small businesses in the bigger conglomerate? Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Brooklyn or Kings Plaza Mall or City Point. If there was a smaller business within and they were about to get evicted before New York on pause, how does this bill help or hurt them? Thank you. Um, so it's it's my understanding that um, after the um, that after the moratorium ends, any um, notices of eviction, which are legally required before a marshal can execute a warrant of eviction, um, must be reserved. So if an eviction was scheduled for um, let's say March 20 or maybe like March 21st um, and that eviction did, did not happen, the warrant wasn't executed, the notice of eviction will need to be reserved again either um, when, you know, at, when they are able to, when this current moratorium ends and or, and or when um, the marshals begin serving, um, serving notices of evictions again in order to execute them. And um, this, I mean, Having notice served again is extremely important, whether for residential um, residential tenants at risk of eviction or commercial tenants at risk of eviction, um, so that um, the tenant is on notice and is aware that the eviction um, can be scheduled and and is coming up. Um, and in terms of how um, a moratorium would benefit um, small businesses that may have been at risk of eviction prior to um, it going into effect, um, this will hopefully allow those small businesses along with other renters um, an opportunity to, um, to devise a plan, hopefully with the assistance of, um, of government funding to stave off that, that eviction. And, this, and, um, and delaying that eviction will provide some opportunity for them to do that. Whereas right now they don't have a chance of, of preventing that eviction from going forward. All right, thank you. Thank you. Now turn to Council Member Chen, who'll be followed by Council Member Chen. Thank Council you. Thank Chen, your clock will start now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Thank you to the chair and happy birthday to our speaker. Um, what I wanted to raise is that um, in my district, particularly, I do have a lot of small property owner um, that are legacy owner that are owned by you know, families for generation. They own one or two buildings or family association uh, based on last name or the part of uh, China that they immigrated from. And they are working with their tenant and trying to work with them. They're not evicting them because they can't pay rent. But one of what they're asking the city for is, you know, help them out with the property tax issue. Uh, what about, you know, deferring uh, a portion of the property tax or delaying payment so that they can also uh, meet their needs. And that's something that they're asking the city. 
at the same time, you know, the water charge are going up. You know, a lot of people are home. They use more water uh, and water bills are coming due. So they are really asking for deferral of these payments, uh, you know, hopefully after the crisis is over. So that's something that we have to look at what we can do as a city for some of these good property owner who are supporting their tenant. At the same time, we still have some really bad property owner who are using these time to raise rent. Uh, they're issuing new leases um, to residents and they're asking for huge rent increase or that they are trying to evict them uh, and not allow them to have succession right, that they have to, to fight for it. I mean, those are the cases that we're still uh, getting and also some landlords uh, not providing heat and hot water. So I think with the bill in terms of the, the harassment, I wanted to ask uh, uh, Colleen from the uh, um, Legal Aid Society, in terms of, and maybe Mike is like other harassment, tenant harassment issues, are they also coming in uh, to your office and to the hotline? And how are we helping these tenants? Because right now the courts are closed, uh, but they need to prepare uh, to fight the harassment or fight the evictions. Thank you. Um, I can start, Mike, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, um, certainly we are hearing about, um, we are hearing from tenants about landlords um, not maintaining essential services like hot water um, or heat on, um, or heat during the night or even during the day when it's um, still cold. Um, and the court, the housing courts remain open for those types of emergency um, housing part proceedings um, related to repairs. The, um, the housing courts are also open for, um, illegal evictions or, or lockout cases because any eviction right now is an illegal eviction. And unfortunately, um, those, those types of cases are still being filed. People are being um, unlawfully locked out of their homes. Um, and certainly we're also hearing about um, tenants who are being made to feel that they need to leave their homes because of the impact that COVID-19 has had on them, either um, as people who are potentially exposed or are sick with um, COVID-19 COVID um, or um, those who have lost income as a result of the pandemic and the shutdown. Thank you. We'll now turn to Councilmember Grudenchik, who will be followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Councilmember Grudenchik, your time is starting now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairs. Happy birthday, Speaker. Uh, Ms. Williams, do we have an estimate, or Mr. McKee or anybody, do we have an estimate on how many people you feel are going to be in danger of not being able to pay their rent on a long-term basis in the city of New York? How many units? Are we talking 10,000 units? Are we talking 100,000? Because that is really a big part of this issue here. Um, you know, if it's 100,000, it's a big, big, big issue. If it's 10,000, much more manageable. I think Ms. Williams is talking, but... There we go. There we yeah. go. Um, I think the, the best um, way that we've had to look at the numbers, so some people are looking at the numbers based on unemployment, the other side and the other way that we've looked at these numbers is based on the loss of- I don't have much time. Do you have an estimate? It's about, we, we think currently in the first month and a half, it's about 30% loss of rent roll for many of our members. So and how many people would that be with 30% of what? If we were looking across the entire city's rental population, that would be a million. Uh, a million, how many units are there of rental housing in the city? Because I'm not 3.5 million. Okay, so that is almost no, roughly uh, 2 million rental units. Oh, okay. No. Okay, oh, sorry. Yeah, 2 million rental, 1.5 1. homeowner. Okay, uh, well, I, I do think, you know, I was involved in the early 90s because I'm old um, in the co op and condo crisis when you were able to take a, a building and have 15%, you know, join and then. Um, you know, people were in danger of losing everything. Um, we were able to to put together in the Queensborough President's Office under uh, the great leadership of Claire Shulman, we were able to save the, the units of 20,000 homeowners in Queens. Um, and it also helped, um, of course, the renters as well, because they weren't dispossessed either. 
And I really think uh, Brad Lander hinted at it, but I, I think that um, we are going to need a holistic um, solution uh, where the banks who made these loans are willing to step forward. Um, and everybody, I think, is going to have to eat something here. Um, I'm not sure that a blanket non-eviction procedure I, I, I will be the answer, but I think we definitely need to have an answer to this. And um, I want to thank the chairs for, uh, for leading this discussion today um, on these uh, important pieces of legislation. Um, but I really think that um, we are going to need uh, really everybody kicking in. And I think uh, my colleague, uh, Margaret Chin, was also quite correct um, in saying that property taxes are something we're going to have to look at. Um, they are out of control in the city of New York. Um, we could put liens on, on property taxes, uh, put a lien on an apartment building um, until it's sold. So um, the city wouldn't be losing out. Um, but I think really in... in my, from where I'm looking at here, um, this is going to take a, uh, a very, very large solution. And I thank you. I thank the panel for being here today and helping me to um, clear my head, so to speak, and uh, start to think about this uh, issue a little more clearly. With that, I waive the balance of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we'll turn to Councilmember Rosenthal and we'll go back to our chairs and Speaker Johnson for any final okay, Councilmember Rosenthal, your time will start now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for your testimony. I, I would like to also try to get to some numbers um, and think about, for the purpose of helping um, the, the city bring this to the attention of um, the federal government, because I really do think at the end of the day, the city's not going to be able to bail out, you know, uh, renters or small property owners. And of course, we all want to prevent some sort of venture capitalists from coming in and swooping everything up and, and making it 10 times worse. Um, and I'm, I'm listening to each of you go back and forth on the numbers and just having a hard time trying to fine tune it. Um, you know, if you say we have 2 million renters, how many people in New York City are on unemployment? Half a million now? Um, not quite sure. And then add on that everyone who can't even get unemployment insurance. Um, do we, can we start to quantify the magnitude of it that way? So, so I would say, I, I think one of the, I understand, I'm hearing a lot about the numbers. I think one of the challenges here is that these are moving numbers. We're pulling things from different resources they're not disaggregated and we can't line them up. So we've got a set of population primarily focused in our Asian communities that were impacted, had a rent loss really largely before any of this tracking started. So put them on a, a month's impact ahead of everybody else. Then we start from tracking. If we use unemployment, we're skipping some of the other populations highlighted before, right? If we're looking strictly at the loss of rent rolls, um, that doesn't necessarily speak to people who have lost, uh, well, so sorry, unemployment also doesn't speak to the fact that people might be um, might be taking unemployment, but still trying to pay their rent or still paying a portion of their rent, right? Um, so that doesn't necessarily fully line up with the ability to pay or not pay your rent, although we ac expect and fully um, anticipate that that's a core part of the population that isn't able to pay. Um, and then we've got another set of the population that isn't tied to unemployment at all, um, is sort of uh, separate from this, um, maybe is still employed, has had huge reductions in their, in their incomes, they're working part-time, um, and they are also struggling to pay rent. They might be paying half, they might be paying a quarter, they might be paying zero. And so all of those numbers, right, and then each, each two weeks, we, we probably scale that number up proportionally because there's more and more people impacted. So that's one of the struggles right now for right. anyone being able to track this. And I would add to that, 
how do we expect people to ever be able to make up right. the rent? Yeah. It's, it's not going to happen. Right. A lot of these jobs are gone. They're not coming back. Plus, there are people leaving the city because of loss of income, loss of employment. Um, and that how you calculate this, I mean, good luck with it. But as Barika points out, it's a moving target. It's going right. to be big. I, it's going to be big. It's going to be a lot. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I just think, you know, we got love. I'm expired. OK, thank you for keeping me on the clock. But thank you to the panelists for all your hard work, everything you're doing um, to keep our tenants safe. There's no question the federal government's going to have to come in. And there's no question but that banks are going to have to step up. That's who was bailed out last time around. Um, and this time right. they need to bail out everyone else. Thank you. Thank you. Just circling back to Speaker Johnson for any final questions and moving on to administration testimony. Uh, thank you, uh, Austin. I just want to quickly go back and ask, uh, is the new economy project on? Yes. Okay. I wanted to ask you guys, you guys have been fighting for a broad set of emergency measures to protect New Yorkers' health, safety, and financial security, including advocating for a moratorium on debt collections in New York State. Can you talk about the short and long-term harmful impacts of money judgments and other debt collection measures on New York City's low-income communities and communities of color? Absolutely. Um, so already debt collection, predatory debt collection is a scourge um, in low-income communities and communities of color. And what we've seen over the years, particularly through our financial justice hotline, is debt collectors using and abusing our courts to get judgments against New Yorkers, violating their due process, using all kinds of shady um, tactics to get judgments and then enforce those judgments against New Yorkers to siphon massive amounts of wealth from communities. So it's, a, it's an issue that um, exacerbates and perpetuates racial and economic inequality in our city. And again, to underscore, these are the same communities that have been particularly harmed by COVID-19 um, and are subject to all kinds of um, racial and economic inequities. Um, and so in the short term, the moratorium is needed as our other immediate um, uh, remedies to some of the issues that we've seen New Yorkers facing. In the long term, what we're hearing from a lot of our community partners and organizations that we've worked with is that while we need to really stretch the bounds of the city's authority and our creativity to address the immediate issues people are facing, and while we need to pressure the state and the federal government to do more, um, we also need to be thinking about building alternative institutions. And New York City is fortunate in one way that um, it has laid a lot of critical groundwork for worker cooperatives, community land trusts, there's an exciting movement for a public bank, which would, over the long term, address a lot of the issues that have been surfacing throughout this hearing, from the banks not serving communities equitably, to landlords harassing and exploiting their tenants, um, and the list goes on and on. And so there's a lot of excitement and enthusiasm for building new institutions and economic models that would create and build resiliency um, and build institutions that are rooted in just ec economic and racial justice and equity. Um, and so we really strongly encourage the council to be thinking about that as we move into this um, economic recovery phase, to be thinking about the types of initiatives the city can adopt to really recreate an economy that works for everybody. Thank you, Andy. And do we have someone from the Community Service Society, CSS on? No, no one from CSS, or do they need to be unmuted? I think uh, Ox, it's a uh, sergeant. It's Oksana. Um, in my Oksana's school. here. Yeah, she's here. So. Okay, hold on a second. Oksana. Thank you. 
Um, thanks, Barika. <laughs> hi. hi, hi, Oksana. So hi. I, first, before I ask my question, I just want to really extend my condolences to you and to the entire CSS family. New York City lost a legend and you lost a colleague in uh, Tom Waters, who such a giant in the housing community and fighting against poverty in New York City for uh, decades. And we know that COVID-19 took his life and we're sending our condolences to you all at CSS and the broader tenant movement is mourning Tom's loss as well. Uh, we really appreciate CSS's continued uh, dedication to fighting for the most vulnerable uh, during this time where you're mourning Tom's loss. So thank you for being here. <clears throat> you all have done a lot of work to show that many New Yorkers were in crisis even before COVID, that 30% of New Yorkers were falling behind on rent before the virus hit. I wanted to ask what percent of New Yorkers do you think are falling behind rent right now as a result of this crisis? And what are the risks that those tenants are going to face and what risks does the city face if we don't step up to protect them now? Absolutely, thank you, thank you so much and thank you for, in, um, for listening to our comments and our testimony. Um, and yeah, I really, I really appreciate um, the statement about Tom. Um, it's really, it's difficult to believe that he's gone. Um, so we know that uh, from the data that was available from the CUNY public health um, research, uh, they've been doing a survey every single week about the number of people who are affected by COVID-19. Um, and from our own research about the number of people who um, have less than $1,000 in savings, um, which is 70% of low-income people have less than $1,000 in savings. Um, in At the end of March, there was probably about 126,000 people who um, were, um, I don't want to say were likely to fall behind on rent, but who lost most of their income and also didn't have enough money in the bank to make a month's worth of uh, rent. So that's 126,000 renters, um, specifically in the private market. So that's excluding everyone who gets Section 8, excluding everyone who lives in public housing, um, because we're making the assumption um, with the CARES Act that their rent is going to be covered at least for the next couple of months. Um, there's no guarantees beyond that, but for the foreseeable future. So that's 126,000 people um, in late March. Um, we don't have figures for April. We don't know what's gonna happen in May, but um, the harsher social distancing rules went into effect, I think on March 16th. Um, so, and lots of people lost jobs after that. So that number is much larger by now. Thank you. Thanks, Oksana. I just want to, uh, yeah, Barika, go ahead. You're unmuted. Um, I just, uh, since we've gotten a lot of questions about specific data, I think Oksana can probably chime in on this and tell me if she disagrees. But I think one thing you all could do, and especially you, Speaker, um, could maybe help us with one thing we know would be would aid a lot of our analysis is being able to get the unemployment data disaggregated at something other than the citywide or county level. So when we just get that big number, it's really hard to do anything with. That translates into very different rents, very different numbers of people in different places. One thing that we've been trying to figure out with New York State DOL, I'm not sure where they are, but if we could get that number at some sort of smaller geography and with more frequency, I think that would be hugely helpful. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, you all testifying today uh, under these trying circumstances. I wanna thank all the council members who I've been listening to all of their questions, uh, very thoughtful questions, I appreciate it. And I just wanna say, you know, the council is doing uh, the best that we can. We are trying here to give some level of protection to uh, renters, to tenants, to New Yorkers who we know are vulnerable and suffering. But again, I think it's just important for the public to understand and realize that with one of the worst economic situations the city has ever been in, with a two and a half billion dollar budget shortfall in the current fiscal year that we're in, not even talking about next fiscal year, which begins on July 1st, we estimate that that number is upwards of another $5 billion, so we're somewhere near $8 billion in the hole, and that number could grow. The city doesn't have the resources and money to be doing many of the things that uh, we all know is the right thing to do, 
which is why we need federal help and federal intervention to help us here. There was a bill I know that was put forward by uh, some assembly members and senators calling for a $10 billion program from the federal government to actually compensate landlords for tenants who can't pay their rent so landlords could still pay their property taxes and real estate taxes, which then wouldn't undermine the city's budget. We know there's another bill that would cancel rent uh, but by Senator Gennaris, uh, but we uh, wanna do anything we can. But ultimately, when you've seen these uh, really outrageous statements by the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell saying that states and federal governments, uh, states and local governments should just declare bankruptcy, the human impact, the toll that that would have on New York City is beyond comprehension. And so his comments softened just a little bit yesterday, but we know how he really feels. Uh, we really need in this next stimulus bill, a significant amount of money for New York City to protect the social safety net. Our North Star in this process is to protect people that are vulnerable, to protect New Yorkers that were struggling and vulnerable before this crisis hit, to protect children and seniors and tenants in low-income communities and communities of color and immigrant communities, people that we knew were struggling before COVID-19 slammed into our city. So throughout this budget process and through our advocacy to both the state and our federal representatives, we are gonna continue to push for money and programs that will help New Yorkers that need it most right now. I really appreciate all of you and your organizations joining us today for this important call. It's a nice way to spend my 38th birthday uh, on this Zoom conference. Uh, and I just wanted to thank you all uh, for being here today. And I'm happy to uh, either turn it back to uh, Chair Cohen or Chair Cornegy uh, or to the committee council so that we can hear from our next witness. Sure, I can now call on members of the administration to testify. So today we'll be hearing testimony from Dana Sussman of the Commission on Human Rights and Sheriff Joseph Vecido of the Department of Finance. Anne Marie Santiago of the Department of Housing Preservation and Development will also be available for questions. Can the three of you please raise your right hands? Will administer the oath once and unmute you to affirm individually at the end. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member questions? Yes, we'll yes. Dana Sussman. Great. Sheriff Vecido? Sure. Yes. Yes. Great. And Marie Santiago. And Marie. Yes. Yes. Great. Wonderful. You, you may begin when you're ready. All right. I think I'm I'm starting. Um, good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Committee Chairs Cornegy and Cohen, and the members of the committees. I'm Dana Sussman, Deputy Commissioner for Policy and Intergovernmental Affairs at the New York City Commission on Human Rights. Thank you for convening today's hearing to address the critical needs of New Yorkers during the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that many of us are now struggling and maybe mourning the loss of friends and family and coworkers. And I wanna take a moment to acknowledge that during this incredibly difficult time. As you likely know, the commission is the local law enforcement agency or civil rights law enforcement agency that enforces the New York City human rights law, one of the broadest and most protective anti-discrimination and anti-harassment laws in the country, now totaling 26 protected categories across ne nearly all aspects of city living, housing, employment, and public accommodations, in addition to discriminatory harassment and bias-based profiling by law, by law enforcement. By statute, the commission has two main functions. First, the commission's law enforcement bureau enforces the city human rights law by investigating complaints of discrimination from the public, initiating its own investigations on behalf of the city and utilizing its in-house testing program to help identify entities breaking the law. Second, the Community Relations Bureau, which is comprised of community service centers in each of the city's five boroughs, um, provides free workshops on individuals' rights and um, businesses, employers, and housing providers' obligations under the city human rights law and in creates engaging pro pro programming on human rights and civil rights issues. Before turning to intro 1936, I'd like to highlight some of the important work that the commission is doing to address discrimination and harassment that we have seen emerging in the midst of the current public health crisis posed by COVID-19. 
In the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a multitude of ways in which the city human rights law intersects with the rapidly changing needs of New Yorkers in crisis. Starting in January, the commission began to monitor an increase in anti-Asian discrimination and harassment, including scapegoating, fear-mongering, and the spread of misinformation as news about COVID-19 started to emerge. In February, the commission started to receive its first reports of New York City-based incidents of discrimination and harassment targeting Asian New Yorkers. At the same time, the Commission's East Asian Communities Liaison, Flora Fernk, and other members of the community outreach team were working regularly with community leaders of Asian and Pacific Islander or API communities throughout New York City to provide information and resources about the Commission's work. From February through mid-April, the agency reported or recorded 284 reports of harassment and discrimination related to COVID-19, over 40% of which, or 115, identify incidents of anti-Asian harassment or discrimination. And I'd just like to note that we released um, numbers last week. Um, the numbers I'm reporting out today are updated as of earlier this week, so the numbers are slightly higher. By comparison, during the same time period in 2019, the commission had received just five reports of anti-Asian discrimination. This influx in reports and cases um, resulted in the commission's April 19th announcement of the formation of a COVID-19 response team to handle reports of harassment and discrimination related to the outbreak. The response team is comprised of staff from the Law Enforcement Bureau and the Community Relations Bureau, working in coordination to quickly and efficiently track and respond to the sharp increases in, in reports of harassment and discrimination connected to the pandemic. The COVID-19 response team has now taken action in 176 of those reports, including, for example, conducting early or emergency intervention, providing know your rights information about how to request a reasonable accommodation, referring the individual to an, another service or agency, or commencing an investigation. In addition, the commission has opened active investigations into 26 matters spanning discrimination in housing, public accommodations, and employment on the basis of race, national origin, disability, and lawful source of income. Additionally, the response team has now successfully resolved and closed 10 matters of COVID-19 related harassment and discrimination so far. The, community, the Commission's Community Relations Bureau, or CRB, has also held bystander intervention trainings with the Center for Anti-Violence Education, which provide techniques to safely de-escalate a bias incident in real time, and just earlier this week or late last week were recently piloted in Mandarin. In early March, CRB co-sponsored community forums in Sunset Park, Brooklyn and Manhattan's Chinatown, educating, educating Asian communities of their rights and protections under the law. The commission has held virtual town halls in partnership with, city, with sister agencies, elected officials and community-based organizations, highlighting workplace rights related to COVID-19, reporting discrimination and harassment related to COVID-19 and responding to hate and bias with restorative justice measures among other topics. The commission continues to produce and promote content to provide key information to impacted communities on their rights in several languages, including many of those spoken by Asian New Yorkers facing, facing heightened harassment and discrimination, um, including in Cantonese, Fujianese, Korean, Mandarin, and Tagalog, with additional languages forthcoming. The commission staff currently speak over 30 languages. Shortly after the outbreak began, the commission launched an online resource page outlining New Yorkers' rights and protections around COVID-19 related harassment and discrimination in housing, employment, and public accommodations, which is regularly updated. The page is available at nyc.gov slash stop COVID hate. The commission also currently has a paid campaign running on social media platforms, directing people to our resources on their rights as they relate to COVID-19. Turning now to intro 1936. Most cases of housing discrimination against a person with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 or um, against a person caring for someone with a suspected or confirmed case are protected under the city human rights laws broad protections based on actual or perceived disability or a person's association with someone with a disability. In addition, essential workers who may face housing discrimination because they are at risk of exposure to COVID-19 are protected by the city human rights laws protections based on lawful occupation. The Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau has directly received 228 COVID-related inquiries, 44 of which are in the housing context. The Commission has provided tenants and co-op residents with information regarding the city human rights law and in some cases contacted management companies or co-op boards to advise them of their responsibilities under the law. For example, where restrictions on residents um, to reduce the spread of COVID-19 did not allow for accommodations for, rents, for residents with disabilities. 
For example, in situations in which buildings are not permitting or facilitating deliveries to the door of individuals with disabilities unable to exit their apartment due to um, their limitations or immunocompromised conditions, COVID-19 COVID self-quarantine, or because they are unable to lift or otherwise carry packages due to a disability, the Commission's Law Enforcement Bureau is able to intervene and provide inquirers with information about their rights to request a reasonable accommodation. While intro 1936 does not amend the city human rights law, it does amend or seek to amend the housing maintenance codes language on protected categories with respect to tenant harassment, which was modeled after language in the city human rights law to protect against harassment based on a person's protected status. That 2017 edition of those protected categories with respect to tenant harassment in the housing code allows tenants to choose whether to file a discrimination claim with the commission or to take a case to housing court. Because of the substantial overlap between existing protections in the city human rights law and the housing maintenance code, several of the protections contemplated in 1936 already exist to protect tenants against harassment in housing. As I said before, this is true for cases of both confirmed or suspected COVID-19 or when an individual has a relationship or association with someone with an actual or suspected case of COVID-19, including, for example, family members who reside in the unit. It is important to note that if a tenant chooses to bring a claim under this provision in housing court, they typically will be precluded from bringing the same claim at the commission. Currently, remedies in housing court are usually limited to civil penalties ranging from $1,000 to $10,000, compared to remedies at the commission, which include uncapped compensatory damages to the victim, civil penalties of up to $250,000, and other affirmative relief. Because the remedies in housing court are more limited than at the commission, it is vital that tenants understand the options available to them and are able to make an informed decision regarding the venue they choose. To the extent that New Yorkers experience discrimination or harassment with respect to any of the protected categories articulated in the city human rights law, we always encourage them to contact the commission. The commission recognizes that people who have COVID-19 are at risk of contracting the virus and or our essential workers must be able, able to live safely and securely and should never under any circumstances have to contend with discrimination and harassment. We are committed to working with the council to ensure that the devastating impacts of this public health, cri health crisis are not unnecessarily compounded and that New Yorkers can live peacefully in their homes free from harassment. We are acutely aware of the vulnerabilities of New Yorkers right now and the commission is ever more committed to defending the human rights of all New Yorkers, especially those impacted by COVID-19. Thank you for um, convening today's hearing and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, quick reminder that the admin, if you, if you mute yourself, you cannot unmute yourself. Um, Sheriff Joseph, yes, go. Good afternoon, members of the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing and Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'm Sheriff Joe Facito, and I'm here today to discuss proposed intro 1912. Before I do, I want to take the time to thank the City Council for its efforts to tackle the many hardships facing New Yorkers during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. We've all been touched by this crisis, my office included, with the loss of loved ones. Sheriff Public Safety Officer Serge Paul passed away last week after a brave struggle against COVID-19. He was a dedicated law enforcement officer, husband, and father, and I would be remiss if I did not publicly acknowledge his dedicated service and sacrifice. The Sheriff's Office fully appreciates what we believe is the Council's intention to provide relief to New Yorkers from debilitating seizures of property and monetary assets. However, Intro 1912, while well-intended, raises significant legal concerns for my office. The work of our office is integrally related to the office, to the work of the judicial system, and governed by state law. May I take a moment to provide a quick explanation about judgment enforcement matters. A judgment is the final outcome of a court case. A judgment resolves the contested issues and terminates a lawsuit since it is regarded as the court's official pronouncement of the law on the action that was pending before it. The judgment states who has won the case and what remedies are awarded to that prevailing party. Remedies may include monetary damages, injunctive relief, or both. Judgments are enforced by writs of execution which can be addressed to the sheriff or in New York City to the marshal, commanding them to give plaintiff possession of land or to enforce the delivery of personal property, which was the subject of an action, or to collect the amount of the judgment, depending on the relief sought in the underlying case. 
As I've described, judgment and execution enforcement are mandates that come from the court. They are under the governance of the state court system and implemented through the state civil practice law and rules. Indeed, they represent the core function of the judiciary branch and the ultimate expression of its independent decision-making authority. We believe that intro 1912 would require actions that interfere with this well-established structure. The bill assigns duties to the sheriff that presupposes the sheriff has control over the judgment and execution process. However, that is not the case. The sheriff is an officer of the court and wholly guided by the exacting statutory steps set forth in the CPLR, which preclude the sheriff's personal judgment or outside review. Courts have repeatedly held that a sheriff cannot look behind the court mandates or review them for error and can be penalized for doing so. For these reasons, it is our view that the sheriff could not comply with the directives of intro 1912 without violating the panoply of state laws that govern the sheriff's role as the civil enforcement official of the courts. In my role as sheriff, I am not a heartless bill collector, but rather an officer of the court who has a duty to enforce the laws enacted for the protection of the lives, persons, property, and health of our citizens. I hope that my testimony today has conveyed my passion for following the law and having the office of the sheriff working productively and cooperatively for the betterment of all New Yorkers. Thank you for your time, and I will now take any questions. Thank you. We'll now open it up for questions from Speaker Johnson and the chair. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate your patience. I know you guys uh, waited for a while to testify. So Sheriff, I wanna thank you for your uh, patience and I wanna um, give you our condolences on the loss of someone uh, in your office. Really sorry, as you said, this is touching all of our lives and we wanna remember all of the folks that have been serving New York City, especially the city workers. So, so thank you for acknowledging uh, this wonderful person who, who served the city of New York. I wanted to ask you, uh, Sheriff, uh, do you have any policies that guide how you decide to prioritize your enforcement actions? Are you trying to avoid targeting low-income New Yorkers right now? Part of our protocols in, during this COVID-19 emergency is we're looking at emergency type orders and orders that affect public safety. So right now, orders of protection are still being enforced. Mental hygiene warrants are still being enforced. Things that involve public safety, we are enforcing. Things that require, the types of court process that require uh, the seizure of money and property, we're looking at very carefully. Uh, there are certain protections in place that are only available when the court system is open and fully functioning. So those are items that we take a careful look at because whenever we seize money or property, those remedies should be available to the person. They should be able to be able to go to court and look to have protection uh, granted by the court. So right now we're not conducting any property seizures, but that's simply because the court system is not fully open and those remedies are not available to them, except for very limited circumstances. So the types of orders we're carrying out, would you would be considering emergency type orders? Sorry about that. Okay. Is it, is it safe to say, Sheriff, uh, and it's, I assume it is because of the answer to the question you just gave, is it safe to say that uh, uh, that you are enforcing judgments during this crisis? Yes. And uh, what if you go and the person says they have COVID-19? Well, the idea of enforcement doesn't necessarily work that way. Um, if we have to serve an order of protection on somebody and they have COVID-19, the deputy sheriff has to serve that person. So our officers have to wear protective gear. We try to have as limited contact with as possible with the person within the confines of the order. So whatever the order tells us to do, we still have to carry out even though COVID-19 is going on, but we have we can take obvious safety precautions for, the, for our officers. Thank you. And if the state moratorium lapses, are you gonna rely on the courts to determine whether someone is protected by the federal moratorium? Uh, we have to. Uh, the, unfortunately, in my role as sheriff, while I have personal opinion, and like I said, my personal feeling is I think that these, these concepts are very good to explore, 
in my role as sheriff, I have to be somewhat agnostic and standoffish, neutral. I can't really weigh in on these positions and I have to rely on the court to be the best guide for what the sheriff is supposed to do. Thank you, Sheriff, and thank you to the members of the administration. I turn it back to the committee council. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any questions from the chairs? Uh, Austin, I'm going to uh, defer. I'm gonna let uh, the committee members ask and then I'll come back. Okay, great. Um, I'll now call on, call on council members in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function with a quick reminder uh, that council members Torres, Yeager, and Powers raised their hands previously to, answer, to ask questions at this time. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to four minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. A sergeant at arms will keep a timer and let you know when to start and when your time is up. We'll begin with council member Torres, followed by council member Yeager. And your clock will start now. Thank you. I have a, a question for the sheriff. Um, sheriff, imagine for a moment the council were to go forward with intro 1912. So it's the law of the city. And then a judge were to issue an eviction warrant in the event of a conflict between a local law and a judicial order, how would the sheriffs respond? And I'm curious to know how the marshals respond. I know DOI is not present at the moment, but what would you do in the event of a conflict between well, a judicial order and a local law? The, the law is very clear on it, that the sheriff can't look behind a judgment. In fact, most of the case law in New York involving a sheriff questioning an order happened here in New York City, and it's very well settled law that if the sheriff is ordered to do something, he can't look behind the reasoning of the court and he must carry out the mandate according to its command. That was the whole principle by having a sheriff be the ministerial officer for the court. And for the sheriff carrying out those duties, the sheriff is granted quasi-judicial immunity, meaning that even if that action was to disobey a current law, the sheriff would be immunized for carrying it out that is that is the protection that is granted to the sheriff because he's carrying out the will of the court. So so even if we were to enact the law, you have no you would not enforce it uh, over a judicial order. Is that the, the sheriff? If the sheriff fails to act, he can be held in contempt. There are two types of contempt in New York State. There's a criminal contempt, which is punitive, and there's a civil contempt, which is coercive. Uh, the court could apply a criminal contempt to me, which would jail me for 30 days, and a civil contempt, which could jail me indefinitely till I perform the act. An example was recently you had a county clerk who refused to take um, uh, marriage licenses. That's a ministerial act. And if the sheriff is required to carry out a ministerial act and he refuses, he faces probably the most severe punishment available under the law for an officer. So I face both a personal liability, criminal and civil. But if I carry out the order, I am fully immunized and I have the full backing of the court to do so. So since you're, since you're an agent of the state court, neither a federal nor a local moratorium is viable without the buy-in of the court. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Unfortunately, the court in the courtroom, the court's process really controls what the sheriff does. And since the sheriff has no ability to look behind the court's order, then whatever the court tells the sheriff to do, the sheriff must do. Uh, the sheriff leaves these issues for the litigation in court. That's why a lot of civil process has a notice requirement. The sheriff gives notice before he does something. And that gives the person the opportunity to go to court to make these claims. Many of these issues that you're bringing forward are claims that would be appropriately made in court, not to the sheriff. Uh, this might be a question for HPD, but suppose in the absence of a moratorium, is there anything that the city could do, the council could do to address egregious cases of rent gouging uh, in an attempt to exploit the COVID-19 crisis? So I don't know that uh, we're prepared to comment on that. I haven't heard that as a a suggestion at this point, a council member, but we can certainly take that back um, to see if there's been any discussion around that particular issue. Like I see my time is about to expire. So thank you for affording me the opportunity. Thank 
you. Now we'll hear from Council Member Yeager, followed by Council Member Powers. And your clock will start now. Thank you very much, um, uh, Sheriff. Thank you for being here. Uh, first, I just want to echo uh, Mr. Speaker's comments. Um, anytime somebody in our great, greater family of New York City employees uh, is taken, it, it's uh, a shock not just to the greater system, but obviously to the employees who are close with that person. And uh, your office being the small office that it is, uh, I'm sure I have no doubt that it's uh, hitting you folks at the Department of Finance pretty hard. And I want to express my condolences. Um, Sheriff, uh, in your opening um, testimony and in Councilman Torres' questions, you really did uh, allude to many of the, of the items that I wanted to talk to you about today and uh, some of which I discussed with the earlier panel. Um, but I just I want to get some more information a little bit just so that we can have some clarity. So if I may, how long have, uh, when did you start working at the Sheriff's Office? 1988. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, at least for myself and for a good number of my colleagues in the council, I, I would think it's uh, fair to say you probably have a greater understanding of your powers and authorities than I do. Um, uh, I, I just want to um, focus, I think, on some of the remedies uh, since it's so clear to me uh, that this law cannot be enforced, uh, introduction uh, 1912. If it were to be enacted, um, it, you would not be legally allowed to follow it under any circumstances. Um, I don't doubt for one second that uh, the mayor would not fire you for not following uh, an unlawful uh, act of this council. I know for sure that the mayor values his oath. I know you value your oath. I value my oath as a member of the council, but I also value my oath as an officer of the court. And a sheriff is an officer of the court, an arm of the judicial system. So I want to focus on some of the remedies that can be done instead. Uh, my understanding, obviously, is that um, your powers come from the CPLR and from state law. Um, but clearly, if the chief judge of the state of New York were tomorrow to issue an order uh, directing judges in the state that they may not issue executions, is it fair to say that you would not receive executions because judges would stop issuing them? Yes, if the court directed us. All right. They would. So, uh, you know, the, the obvious uh, solutions to these problems don't come from uh, the well-intentioned uh, efforts here in the council, but the uh, notion that there are places in this state that govern your activities and you do not have the ability to decide to refuse to execute on, um, on an execution that you receive. But more to the point that you stated earlier, there are remedies uh, should you receive an execution. Uh, number one is there are notice provisions, correct? Correct. Okay. And number two is when you actually seize property, you don't immediately that day or the next morning turn it over. You actually hold it for quite a while uh, to allow for it to fit within the, within the confines of the sheriff so that the uh, debtor can actually collaterally attack the execution and the underlying judgment if necessary. Is that correct? Correct. So there are remedies, as we know. Um, my concern, of course, is, as I've said, uh, Sheriff, and you may, you may not necessarily be aware of this, but I say this uh, for the greater public. I have, in my time in the council, uh, been, I believe, very protective of the authorities of the council. I believe that the council has authorities as it is stated uh, in our charter and under state law, but it is limited. And when it is limited, we should not try to cross that line. We should respect the authority of the law. Uh, in this case, the state is the place that needs to uh, make these instructions to you. And I would suggest to my colleagues that is the better way to go with respect to the good intentions of this law. And with that, I yield I'm back my time. Thank you. Next, we'll be hearing from Council Member Powers, followed by Council Member Cabrera. Sheriff, how are you doing? I don't like me, Mr. Sheriff. Uh, how are you, sir? Nice, nice to see you, you again. Uh, and hope you're hanging in there. I'm very sorry to hear about, uh, I think it was your employee or her old colleague that passed away and wishing all of you the best. Um, and thank you to everybody else as well from HPD and, and, uh, and uh, uh, Human Rights. Um, just two very quick questions, just as I'm looking at this the, the 1912, um, does this, we're talking about tenants today and um, one of, I actually have a legislation around security deposits in the, in the city council. And I'm wondering if on the other side of this equation, would your ability to do money judgments 
I'm just looking at the bills. The, Ed, the, would your ability to do money judgments here affect a tenant who is suing the landlord to get their uh, security deposit returned to them? And would you be able to take action in that case? Well, supposing that there was a ban, and as I said earlier, we don't think we would be able to carry through on it. The ban would work both ways. In fact, it would probably impact uh, the state has a tribunal uh, community and housing renewal. They actually have a tribunal where they award triple damages to a tenant who've been, who has been uh, rent overcharged. So the, the, the workings of the justice system on both sides would be impacted by this type of legislation. Meaning that if there was a rent overcharge or like a security deposit issue, you would, and, and you were meant to, on behalf of the tenant, help them out to restore their money or damages that you would, at least for this period of time, not be able to do that? Correct. The, the sheriff is everyone's sheriff. We carry out the mandates of the court uh, and everybody is entitled to have their judgment enforced impartial. Understood. And you would be able to then do it after this period ended? If this, if, you know, I understand there's a constitutional question here that you're raising, but let's just say we were able to figure that issue out. You would be able to do it, but it would, it would be at the end of that period of time. I, I, I don't want to speak to what the legislation would look like. I could only speak okay. to if the pro appropriate remedies were available to stop the sheriff, the sheriff would be stopped and we'd follow the, the directions that were authorized to follow. Okay. And I, I, I apologize because I don't always know the exact uh, intersection of where you hand over to the marshals, but I know the marshals have some jurisdiction over things like parking tickets and I think other, uh, other tickets that are unpaid in the city. And okay. uh, yeah, a, a quick uh, reference. The, the sheriff is a law enforcement agency. The off we're, uh, we're, we're like a small police agency that handles the enforcement of court orders. Uh, we are the, the courts that we handle are all the courts in New York City. So all the, all the courts of the city and the state, the sheriff is the enforcement officer. The marshal is the enforcement officer for the civil court of the city of New York. They okay. work in a similar fashion, but I don't want to speak for them. Okay. And I think we, I'm, I, I am, I'm confident they'll be, you know, probably testifying later today. But I just, just my question then is maybe you can speak on this issue and then I'll, if the marshals do testify, ask this question. For things like red light camera tickets, speeding tickets, I guess parking tickets too, is that impacted by this legislation if we are looking to, uh, uh, I guess, I guess to take some, some action related to things that um, uh, many issues we talk about like speeding and red light cameras and things like that? Yes. The, uh, most How is that impacted? The, most of the uh, public safety judgment enforcement in the city relies on judgment. So like building code violations, fire code violation, speeding violations, all of those ultimately culminate into a decision that's docketed with the New York City Civil Court as a judgment. And so, that'd, be put on, that'd be put on pause for the time period if the, yes. this the legislation in, has that view. Okay, great. Thank you. Thanks for answering the question, Bill. My time's up anyway. Thanks. Thank you. We'll now hear from Councilmember Cabrera, followed by Councilmember Chen. And your clock will start now. I'm going to use a very short amount of time because my question was answered uh, by the questions that uh, were asked my, by my colleagues. Thank you so much. I pass. All right. Councilmember Chen. Okay, sure. yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you to the panel. Um, I first wanted to really uh, thank the Deputy Commissioner Sussman from uh, uh, Human Rights Commission uh, for working with our community uh, in fighting xenophobia and hate crime. And we got to do more uh, to educate. Uh, I think the bystander training are great. My staff's all taking it. And uh, we want to urge more people to report uh, the hate crime um, that is happening, unfortunately. Um, my question is um, two things. I don't know if someone from Department of Finance is here. Uh, one of the things that I talked about earlier was, you know, support for property owners, who, small property owners who are providing affordable housing, rent regulated housing, and they need relief. And I talked about uh, property tax uh, deferral, but we know the city needs money and the only way we can get out of this mess is we get the federal dollars. But in our city council uh, response to the mayor that I think there was precedent sets, um, I guess back in the, the economic crisis in the 70 that 
um, large property owner, uh, commercial property owner that could afford to pay uh, property tax up front, that we should encourage them to do that so that we can give a deferral program uh, to the smaller property owner who are providing uh, affordable housing in our district. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, can answer that, if there are anybody from the Department of Finance. If not, we'll bring it back to the administration. And the other question is to Deputy Commissioner uh, San Diego in HPD. Uh, you know, during this time, as I said, we still have predatory landlords, bad landlords who are still doing tenant harassment. So I'm just interested to see, like, um, how many cases uh, have HPD uh, been working on? Uh, the Community of Human Rights uh, gave us some really good statistic in terms of complaints. And so if you can uh, address that issue, that would be great. So as you know, the, the mayor has supported us greatly in tenant harassment uh, initiatives and HPD had started uh, and has a t uh, tenant harassment, an anti-harassment unit. Uh, which tenants can contact. And we have continued to receive complaints during this period. Um, most around heat, hot water, we are still responding with inspections to those conditions. And we're taking information from tenants to follow up uh, once we're uh, in a better state to do full building inspections, because that is mm -hmm. what mostly what the anti-harassment unit does. Um, so we've received about 60 complaints during this period. Um, and we're continuing to reach out to all of those tenants who contact us to make sure that um, once we can uh, continue with our harassment, anti-harassment inspections, do uh, uh, inspections for violations, conditions in the buildings, we will be ready to continue that. Do you know if all those complaints uh, came in through HPD or some of them uh, from referrals from elected officials office or? They've community-based um, organization. The vast majority of have been through three one one, who uh -huh. refers them to HPD. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. We will now circle back to our chairs and the speaker for any final questions for the administration before moving to public testimony. Chairs. Uh, I appreciate that. Uh, I did want to say uh, uh, thank you to the administration. Uh, uh, for your patience. I know it, it, the hearing has been you know, long, so uh, I want to say thank you for that. Uh, to HPD, I, I wonder if I really, maybe I should have asked this at the last panel, uh, but I, I, I'm of some thought that perhaps, you know, eviction is a legal proceeding in the state of New York. Housing court is uh, uniquely set up to deal with those. It, it, and we've talked about, you know, tenants and landlords and property owners all differently situated. Uh, if maybe housing court isn't really the best place to try to sort this out as the time, when the time comes, uh, as opposed to looking, I mean, it would be great to find some macro policy that just solved everyone's problem in one, in one great piece of legislation. But I, I wonder if, if HPD has any thoughts on, on uh, you know, maybe the individualized approach at housing court might be, might be the way to go, or if you have thoughts one way or the other. Um, I think, as some of the advocates said, housing court would be totally overwhelmed if and when we ever got to a position where all of these cases and all of these people that they are talking about uh, at risk wound up in ev eviction proceedings or wound up in some other proceedings in housing court. I think uh, the mayor, you know, is continuing to look and has advocated for a lot of the um, initiatives that have been talked about today. Again, we continue to uh, look to our federal and state partners for financial support. Um, you know, getting ahead of this before it has to come before housing court or any other type of, I think, judicial or, or uh, administrative body on an individual case by case basis is really how uh, this would have to be addressed. So I know that there are uh, many people working on this issue, looking for guidance, looking for support um, from outside the city. Um, and I think that that would be the way that we all should continue to push. Uh, I certainly agree that obviously that we need federal support. I know that, uh, you know, the speaker has been a very loud voice on that. Uh, I've spoke to my uh, congressional representative about the, the city's needs. Uh, I know that we all will. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Austin. Are we, do we have everybody? Uh, I just wanted to ask one, one question. Oh, listen, please, uh, Rob. I'm back, Andy. Sorry. Great, uh, Rob. Uh, I, I, 
I'm pretty sure that with this esteemed group of council members, this question may have been asked, but I'm just curious whether or not there's a belief that there's enough resources to actually uh, effectively and efficiently look at tenant harassment cases. So I don't know if someone asked, um, I don't know if there's a complaint being made by um, HPD uh, about the, the, the staff size and the, the requirements now that have expanded their duties, but I'm just curious as to whether or not there's an opinion that the necessary resources are already in existence or are there more resources needed to, to do this job, especially the job of uh, um, uh, investigating these cases effectively? So I think there are a couple of different uh, issues on the table here, council members. So you know that the mayor uh, is in full support of anti-tenant harassment measures. And I think uh, between HPD, DOB, HRA, a number of agencies who deal with tenant harassment generally, um, a lot of resources have been put forth. If you're speaking specifically about the COVID related uh, cases that we are talking about today, um, I don't want to speak on behalf of, of uh, the, commu uh, the commission who testified about their resources and what they've been doing. So I would defer to them um, specifically in that area. Well, I won't hold up moving forward because again, I believe that my colleagues who I'm very proud of uh, being a member of this body uh, have probably asked uh, questions that are relevant to the questions that I was going to ask. So uh, I thank you though uh, for, for appearing today. You're welcome. Thank you. All right, with no further questions from chairs, we'll be turning to public testimony. Thank you all for waiting. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individ individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes and a Sergeant at Arms will let you know when to begin and when your time is up. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce you may begin before delivering your testimony. I would now like to welcome Ava Farkas to testify. Hold on. Ava, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Sorry, I just heard my name. Can you give me one second? Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to thank Speaker Johnson and the Committee on Housings and Buildings and the Committee on Consumer Affairs and Business Licensing for having this hearing. Uh, my name is Ava Farkas and I'm here to testify in strong support of intros 1912 and intro 1936. Met Council's mission is to fight for housing as a human right the fact that it is not a human right has exacerbated this current COVID-19 crisis and its health impacts. 92,000 New York State residents are homeless and cannot shelter in place. And if we do not have a plan post eviction moratorium, then millions more will find themselves in the same predicament. I wanna thank uh, members of the city council for supporting one of the critical services that Met Council provides which is our tenant rights hotline, which is now more important than ever for New Yorkers. Our hotline calls are confirming what everyone knows, the tenants who were barely able to afford their rents before, the pandemic are completely unable to now. Our hotline calls have gone from questions about getting repairs to questions almost exclusively about inability to pay the rent, either due to layoff, reduction in hours, or a roommate's layoff or reduction in hours. We have also gotten at least one call from a healthcare worker whose roommate and primary tenant has been harassing her into leaving the apartment before her sublease is up. So intro 1936 is critically important. In addition, we conducted a survey with uh, our base. Um, 556 people responded. So this is a self-selecting survey but I want to share the data with all of you. Um, of the 556 people who took our survey about how COVID-19 is impacting their ability to pay rent, 80%. Sorry. My time up. 
if you have additional testimony, we'll review all written testimony submitted. Because I'm okay. to make sure to look at it, all right? Um, next, I would like to welcome Julia Durante Martinez to testify. And Julia, your clock will start when you begin your testimony. Hi. Um, good afternoon, Chairs Cohen and Carnegie and committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Julia Durante Martinez, and I'm a campaign coordinator at New Economy Projects. Um, as my colleague Andy Morrison noted on the first panel, uh, in addition to wide, we are also working to expand community land trusts in New York City, including through a citywide community land trust discretionary funding initiative. We welcome the steps that Council has taken to combat housing discrimination and displacement during the COVID-19 crisis through intros 1912 and 1936. In addition to protecting New Yorkers from harassment and evictions, it is critical that Council support community-led institutions like community land trusts to ensure a just recovery in New York City's communities of color and to the community's interest and least use of the land for permanently affordable housing and other local needs. As community governed organizations, CLTs have the relationships and trusts to address rapid response needs during times of crises. And more than a dozen emerging CLTs citywide are engaged in COVID-19 mobilization efforts from conducting wellness check calls to residents and connecting tenants to legal assistance to distributing food and supplies to elderly and homebound community residents. Nationally, CLTs also have a track record of stabilizing housing for low income families and communities including preventing foreclosures in the wake of the 2008 financial crash and aiding in recovery efforts after the hurricanes in Puerto Rico. Now more than ever, New York City must invest in proven community-led solutions like CLTs to strengthen and stabilize neighborhoods that have long borne the brunt of housing and public health crises. We urge City Council to sustain and expand its support for CLTs and community-led cooperative economic development. We are calling for renewed fiscal year 2021 discretionary funding, which will directly support the hardest hit neighborhoods and build institutions that will be crucial to prevent evictions, That's foreclosures, right. and speculation in the wake of economic devastation wrought by COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you. We would now like to welcome Joseph Condon to testify. Joseph, your clock will begin when you begin your testimony. Uh, good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony. Uh, thank you, committee chairs. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. My name is Joseph Condon and I am providing this testimony on behalf of the Community Housing Improvement Program, also known as CHIP. CHIP is an organization made up primarily of small and medium sized owners and operators of rent stabilized housing in New York City. Our members run hands on small businesses by managing their own buildings and becoming long term fixtures in their communities. During the COVID-19 pandemic, these members and their staff are on the front lines, making sure people have safe, clean, properly functioning apartment buildings to live in while the shelter in place order is in effect. Because our members are community oriented, they are extremely sympathetic to the painful financial circumstances that COVID-19 has created. According to a survey of our members, more than 50% of them have already entered into payment agreements with tenants who have been impacted by COVID-19. Another 25% of our members who responded said that they expect to offer some relief on a case-by-case -case basis moving forward. And almost all of our members have provided information on unemployment benefits and other benefits to their tenants. Now we understand that not everyone who has lost income will be eligible for those benefits, nor will those benefits make up all of the lost income for those who are eligible. But SHIP members and other property owners are working with these tenants to figure things out. Property owners and managers are in the best position to deal with the variety of circumstances tenants are fa facing. But if everyone else who can pay rent just stops paying, the ability of an owner to provide relief to those who can't get it anywhere else is significantly diminished. Now, despite this being a time where we need to put politics aside and work together, many tenant activists are using the COVID-19 crisis as an opportunity to push a political agenda. Canceling rent without also providing relief for the expenses of small property owners is not a workable option. It should not be realistically considered by these committees unless there is some commensurate relief on the expense side. Time up. Relief in the area of property taxes is an excellent complement to any moratorium. 
between 30 and 40% of a tenant's rent payment goes to the city in the form of property taxes. By only focusing on one side of the equation, these proposals add fuel to the political fire of anti-housing activists who are calling for a rent strike for all. This is one of the main reasons CHIP opposes 1912. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. We'd now like to welcome David Hemtop to testify. David, your clock will begin when you start your testimony. Okay. Uh, could everyone see me? Could yes. you hear me? Yes. Okay. Dear honorable members of the New York City Council, thank you for hearing my testimony today. I know that you're considering passing new legislation in the wake of this COVID-19 pandemic to allow tenants not to pay rent. I would like to ask the council members who are in favor of this, a few questions. Landlords are currently providing crucial and essential services to their tenants. Those essential services could only continue if landlords could continue to pay to collect their rent. Specifically, how are landlords expected to pay for heat and hot water if tenants are not gonna be paying rent? How do you expect landlords to pay for water and sewage that allows tenants to take showers and to go to the bathroom? Landlords are paying supers and porters to put the garbage that tenants are generating today. How are landlords continuing to clean up and mop public spaces without the critical cash flow that comes from rent collection? How does city council expect landlords to pay property taxes without rent? Property taxes have skyrocketed, skyrocketed in the last three years to a level that is equal to 35% of our rental income. Why is a landlord trying to collect rent termed as harassment? Is a landlord not entitled to collect rent for providing shelter, heat, hot water, and cleaning services and et cetera to their tenants? Why are we even using the term harassment? All we wanna do is just collect the rent on an apartment so we can continue paying our property taxes, paying our supers, paying the oil company that's gonna deliver oil tomorrow. We gotta to pay Con Edison to keep the elevators rolling. Why is government considering to throwing the burden of this pandemic completely on the landlords? Why is city council not considering a bill to allow people to walk into a local supermarket pick up some groceries and walk out without paying. Time expired. Thank you and good luck. Thank you. We would now like to welcome Kenneth Litwack to testify. Kenneth, your clock will begin as you start your testimony. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Carnegie, Cohen and Speaker Johnson and the members of the uh, committee. I wanna thank you for this opportunity to testify before you today on behalf of the Marshals Association of the City of New York. I'm going to speak in opposition to intro 1912. Since 1979, when I was first appointed as counsel and inspector general to the New York City Sheriff, I've been involved in this aspect of the law. I became director of the Marshals Bureau for the New York City Department of Investigation after uh, serving for the sheriff. And that is the unit that is responsible for regulating New York City Marshals pursuant to state law. I'd like to point out to you that uh, the marshals employ approximately 250 people who are New Yorkers whose lives would be deeply impacted by the long-term disruptions to their operations. Our first objection to intro 1912 is that the city council does not have the jurisdiction or legal authority to enact such a measure. There is no statutory basis that would permit the city council to restrain a marshal or a sheriff's functions. Marshals act pursuant to court orders which command them to act and are part of a complex system where it is the duty of judges to determine the special circumstances of a particular case. Section 16092 of the New York City Civil Court Act specifies that it is the appellate division which has the regulatory authority over marshals. A marshal is an independent officer whose position was created by the state legislature and whose powers and duties are prescribed by state statute. In addition to the Civil Court Act, marshals get their powers, uh, which are defined by the New York State CPLR. Um, our next objection is that while we understand the intent of this legislation is to help those in need, which have been negatively impacted by COVID-19, we believe the proposal- Time expired. Austin can, Austin, can we give the marshal a little more time? I, I think this testimony is 
particularly Jermaine. I just want to let him finish, right? Jermaine, thank you. Thank you. I will restart the clock at two minutes. Thank you. If the proposed legislation were enacted as written, it would negatively impact small claims court and a needy plaintiff's ability to enforce a money judgment. As a result of this legislation, plaintiffs would have no way of recovering money they are legally entitled to, which adds insult to injury during these trying times. New York City marshals enforce approximately 2,000 to 2,500 uh, money judgments in small claims court each year. It is imperative that the council consider the budgetary uh, implications of this bill. We are a key part of an approximate $80 million in revenue that the city collects in judgments every year on parking speed, red light violations, camera violations, uh, as well as environmental control board violations. This is a significant source of annual revenue for the city of New York and is needed more than ever as the city's budget deficit continues to expand. Furthermore, the money judgments marshals execute in these categories serve as a deterrent to this type of behavior and further the goals of the city safety programs like Vision Zero. I'd also like to point out that putting aside these objections, uh, in the past, marshals have cooperated with the city in, for example, during 9-11 and uh, during Hurricane Sandy when uh, in, in cutting back on evictions through the, through the city and working with the city. We've been very sensitive to these issues. We look forward to working with the council on this issue, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. We'll now turn for any questions from the chairs. We have a question from Council Member Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Mr. Litwack, I'm, I'm glad you're here to testify because you, you're adding clarity to a place where the sheriff was not able uh, uh, to opine. Um, he limited his uh, opinions to his own powers and authorities, um, but it's very clear from what you're saying that uh, should the council, and this, this goes to uh, a very similar question that I asked earlier, should the council pass this law? Um, and the law says that you are to ignore a lawfully delivered execution. Uh, you would not be empowered to uh, abide by the council law. You would have to abide by your powers as stipulated by Section 1609 of the Civil Court Act and uh, Article 52 of the CPLR. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. It would be improper and illegal for a marshal to refuse a command of the court. Okay. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. All right, with no more questions, this concludes the public testimony. So if we've inadvertently forgotten to call on someone who's registered to speak, if that person could raise their hand using the Zoom raise hand function in the next minute or so, we'll try to hear from you now. We'll wait for a bit. Seeing none, it looks like we can turn this back uh, to chairs here for some closing remarks. Uh, so, so Andy, I don't know if you want to go first. You, you, you kind of held this down. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief. I really just uh, want to say thank you to everybody who testified. I think I mentioned this in my opening, but it took an enormous amount of work on the part of the staff to uh, bring this, uh, this hearing off and a tremendous amount of prep. Uh, Kisa, you know, from our committee, uh, my my ledge director, Patty, like it, it was an enormous amount of work and I, I, I don't want to uh, hurt my arm patting uh, patting us on the back here, but uh, I, I thought this went very, very well. And I want to say uh, thank you for everybody for participating. And I want to say thank you for your partnership, Rob. I think you did a good job. Thank you. Um, I, I'd like to say for those who are watching, um, an essential function of the council 
is to meet and to advocate through legislation and policy on behalf of the voice of the city. Uh, I think this was a balanced effort at looking at what we're facing uh, uh, as it relates to tenant displacement during uh, COVID. But I think what we heard were, was testimony that, um, you know, that, that advocates on behalf of uh, small landlords as well, and which, which demonstrates the need to get this right and to make sure that we, are, while, you know, that we don't um, have a singular focus. And as a council, we have a duty to hear these things. And um, this is a unique environment to do it in. Um, I, I have to say that I've never been prouder of the council to honor its commitment to uh, act on behalf of its citizens, even in this unique way. I wanna thank all the staff that was involved because what people don't know is you see this couple of hours of, of hearing and of testimony but there were countless hours put in prior to and in countless hours that will be put in in debriefing and making sure we have all the information. So I wanna personally thank all the staff involved, including the security staff who make sure that um, uh, those who are supposed to be here are here and those who are not are, uh, uh, are not allowed uh, to disrupt this. So thank you again. And I think this is the part, uh, Austin, where I gavel out. Uh, my, with my favorite drumsticks, by the way. So this concludes the hearing of housing and buildings. And um, uh, with my partnership with Andy Cohen. Uh, thanks, Andy. Great job, Rob. Thank you.